in this video here, you guys invited me to do this video. I'm going to tell you now, you're going to hear things you've never heard before. I have done a deep dive on Australia in the past, oh, and then I left it alone, put those notes up, and came back to it when, when I found some corresponding material in New Caledonia. Then I found things about New Zealand. Then I found things about Dwarka, uh, ancient, a, the ancient traditions of Lumeria and Mu, and uh, all these different kingdoms that existed in the water. There's water there now, but there wasn't water yeah. in the Indian Ocean at all times. We have traditional records of, of land masses that were out there so yeah, right. if you're ready hey we can dive in because uh yeah. australia is something i've got i've always been very interested in because it's just a red wasteland in parts of it and i know where that red dirt came from it's one of the things i Fantastic. study a lot but uh, let's do it i know that archaeologists of the australian national university they had excavated ruins that match the design and expanse and in expanse very similar ruins that have been found in Sumer, Babylon, Egypt, and Israel. This is in Australia. It was discovered by the Australian National University. And because I was so shocked to find out, because I did not know that there had been some type of infrastructure in ancient, uh, in ancient Australia. I, I have my tablet here. I have a, a picture of the excavation. You guys might not be able to see it very good. Can you see yeah, that? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're, yeah. They're, they are digging down, finding chambers, corridors, galleries of rock. This is in Australia. Yeah. And this is this isn't some this isn't some wackadoodle. This isn't some wackadoodle uh, uh, guy out there, you know, with a tin foil hat and all that. This is the Australian National University scientists conducting these excavations. So it's amazing the things that are kept from yeah. the public. You just mm. have to you have to do deep dives to find these things out. Yeah. <laughs> Australia, um, gosh, Tartaria, Australia, Kelly and I, and we have with us Jason Brashears. Most of you will know Jason. Um, if you don't, um, all the links will be below. Go across and check out his work, um, and you will, um, yeah, be amazed. He's got a, a huge body of work. And, of course, um, we are Tartaria, Australia. So today we're going to get into, dive into Jason's brain and see what we, we can pull out on Australia and Australia's past as that's what we look into here. So welcome, Kelly. Woohoo. How are you? Hello, hello. Good morning, everyone. Hi, Jason. Welcome to welcome our channel. Jason. We're so excited to have you here. Thank you. I'm, I'm excited to be here. Uh, it's, uh, awesome. it's, I'm, I'm, I'm really intrigued by how you guys do this, this, this uh, movie background. And you have in the back. That's all. Uh, it's pretty interesting. Yeah, yeah. The, the clouds we had. Yeah, yeah. Were, yeah, I have like a. Um, I'm a, a bit obsessed with the whole art side of um, all of our deep diving. So right, when right. it comes to backgrounds and videos and t-shirts, I'm like totally in. <laughs> right, right. I, I didn't see. I didn't see the last video yet. I was reading comments on uh, uh, Tartarian cities in the sky. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah uh, yeah, that was a. Uh, I, I don't know if y'all focused only on like the Australian area or all that, but but there has been three or four incidents in the historical record where whole populations swore up and down. Like in 1890, they just swore up and down that a city structure was just stuck there in the sky, floating. And uh, yeah, one was in North America in 1890. Another one was in 1561 with a bunch of other astronomical, really weird stuff. You guys know I'm I'm, I'm a student of Charles Fort. Yeah, if, if Fort wrote it, I'm gonna I'm gonna know it. 
I want to know it. Well, I love that, Jason. I mean, before we dig in this massive deep dive and footnote audience, we've been warned that Jason is going to speak his little brain out. <laughs> and um, we're going to have to really like get in there when we've got a question. So I'm going to just, before we even deep dive into Australia, which is just so exciting to, to see the content you have there. Um, what are your thoughts about the floating city? Like where we've gone with our theory is that Tartaria potentially was a civilization of the air. And we've linked that notion to the buildings having these sort of tall towers, the whole consciousness around the steampunk movement, the lack of sewage and toilets and kitchens and bathrooms are basically everything you need to be human in these buildings are missing. And this like ability to, you know, use the magnetic levitation force. So we've really like started to look at this possibility that Tatari could have been um, a floating civilization. So thoughts on that, Jace? Well, we'll um, I could actually contribute to that. I didn't, uh, I didn't know. I, I have a lot, I actually have a lot of notes on something like that. I, I would just, I wasn't prepared for that for right now, but I will say this <laughs> off, the top of, off the top of my head. Um, David Hatcher Childress, and we're going to discuss him today because I, I want to cite his book on my tablet. I'm going to show you what that book looks like. So I know some of your uh, some of your readers are going to want some of your some of your listeners are going to want to order this book. David Hatcher Childress has traveled the entire world, and he wrote a single book called Lost City of ancient Lemuria in the Pacific. It's a book of archaeology and history. It is packed full of data, diagrams, archaeological discoveries, relics, artifacts. It's just fantastic. In that book, he even theorizes when he wrote it in the early 80s that the only explanation for the Mari that have been found all spread throughout the tiniest islands of Melanesia, Polynesia, and Micronesia, all the way to Easter Island, South America, connecting Australia to, and connected to mainland China, the only explanation for these flat top tiny pyramids that are almost as large as the islands themselves is that something was skipping from island to island island from the sky mm -hmm. and every once in a while that that vehicle had to touch down and either recharge or rest or whatever and or maybe it can only travel at in, in the daytime but he links it to the ancient eastern v vimana aircraft of the like 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 the vimana shasatru the ancient vedic text that talks about how to build phenomena of uh, viminas and how to uh aerial combat maneuvers and uh, uh pre pre-flight mm. checks these are all in vedic scripture most people don't know these these texts have been found we're talking about four thousand year old sanskrit texts that teach you how to build aerial structures and then do like 20 to 30 pre-flight checks and if you get in a battle in the sky excuse me a battle in the sky these vedic texts even teach you how to mm. dog fight flying your your, your your vimana so i can add to that that yes there probably was a flight uh the structures were probably uh, lighter than air base like zeppelins were probably not mm, new of course uh, they're only they're only it's only a rediscovered technology that was quickly mm. suppressed but uh yeah, it's there. I can follow the reasoning. Uh, I'm very open to that because of what yeah. has been found. Uh, not because I'm, not because I'm imaginative and I would love the idea, but we do have archaeological anomalies that are inexplicable, inexplicable without there being a very large presence of aerial aircraft. And we have the Nazca. We have the Nazca geoglyphs. We have even in Australia. I, I don't know if you guys know this, but Australia has the largest aggregate glyph in the world. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to yeah, talk about great. that. Oh, I have. I even have pictures of that. Right. But agroglyphs, agroglyphs come from a certain time period. Everybody was doing them at the same time. But I'm going to cover that in this video about that. It's interesting that you even mentioned that because we haven't even prepared anything for this video. We were just going to do an Australia freestyle. Yeah. But but uh, that's very interesting. You mentioned that because I'm going to cover some of that data. I have the I have the the slides on my tablet. Fantastic. Yeah. Well, I mean, coming live from the Australian Tartaria site, man, we are right into the notion of floating, flying cities at the moment. We've like we've deep dived on the concept of there being missing suns. And Campbell mentioned to me that you actually had connected the pyramid, the use of the pyramid. And I asked him, well, I wonder if that has something to do with the missing sun and drawing energy during a reset via a sun through those pyramids. So I just love, let's just start, let's just deep dive. So Jason's going to start talking to us about his um, context about Australia. So let's go, Tartaria, sure. Australia, we'll take it away, in. Jason. Start wherever you want to start. Oh, let me look. And we'll follow behind you with our imagination. All right, <laughs> I'm going to look at these slides real quick because a, a picture 
Twitter is truly a thousand words. Believe yeah, yeah. That. If you want to share screen, just go for it. You know what? I'm not set up for that. No, I have the. Like I, have, I have all. I have all these on a tablet, and then I'll, I'll share them. I'll blow them up and share them. I may have to turn the light off so you can see it good, though. No worries. But uh, let's see something real quick. Let's do an experiment. I'll just do an experiment real quick. Um, I think that's worse. No, wow. it doesn't work. It doesn't work at all. No, nah, it's just. Oh, oh, there you go. Oh, it no, works no, there. That's good. Yeah, that's, now it is. Yeah. Yep. All right, we've okay. got that. All right, cool. I'll just keep that. I'll just keep that light off. Young still see me. Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, yeah. Pictures worth a thousand words. This is why I have these slides. I do that for a lot of my presentations. I don't need actual cliff notes. I need images because the mm -hmm. images, the images pull back all the research. They pull back everything I've studied because I just, uh, I need to see pictures and I'll keep pictures on my screen when I'm doing my own videos on my own channel and they'll just trigger me. I'll, I'll be able to go through the data. But I got to see those pictures. And, you know, I'm confident that most of your listen listeners, they already know the controversy of the Egyptian petroglyphs found mm -hmm. in Australia. Many of, many of you guys, many of them can, can, can tell everybody else exactly where they are. But dismissing petroglyphs as Egyptian in origin is not as conclusive as establishment critics convey. Let me explain. So here's a here's a pic of some of some of these Egyptian uh, deals. You guys seen these many times, but some of your listeners might not have. Yeah, in Gosford. Some of your Gosford listeners Gosford might not have seen these. Yep. Yep. Yeah. These are actual pictures of Australia. These are Egyptian hieroglyphs in Australia. And many people, many people have a. Uh, Many people have checked these out, even academics. But, I mean, uh, they're very popular. They're not hard to find. But there's a big difference between Egyptian demotic and hieratic scripts. Vast differences in style and connotations between, like, the pyramid text and, uh, let's see, the coffin text. When, when people say Egyptian hieroglyph, the only one, only one idea appears in their minds, which are talking about a civilization that had hieroglyphs for about 3,000 years, and every two or three centuries, they were totally different and often changed their meanings and their syntax. So these are the things that you have to have to be considered when you find Egyptian relics in other countries, because the nuances attached to those definitely tell you when those Egyptians were in that country. Mm -hmm, you follow mm -hmm. me? Yep. So this is the type of study that yeah. Barry Fell did. Barry Fell wrote a book called America BC, where he studied Egyptian hieroglyphics in Central, South, and North America and realized that a lot of them weren't even by Egyptians. They were by Libyan navigators who, who were using the Egyptian script because the Egyptians often use, use the Libyans as labor in their ships. So it's just, it's just a point of interest. But, but there were also differences in expression between the scribes who were adepts and the mariners who left their sigils on the stone all over the ancient world. Not everybody was a scholar. So, so when we have these cr critics say, well, that's not Egyptian glyphic, uh, a glyphic because all these sigils right here are at 45 degrees to the crane's nose. And then uh, directly under the crane's nose, there's a, a frog foot. And because they want to isolate particulars and make them absolutely exact, this is how academia dismisses stuff all the time when the actual glyphs mm. are legitimate they were just uh, they were done by somebody with a, a equivalent of a sixth grade education he's been a shipman and he's been a wainwright all his life but he knew how to write he just wasn't as good as somebody in the nobility so we find this all over the world we find these glyphs and all that, and they're dismissed by academia almost every single time because they aren't found in egypt which is ridiculous i mean i don't know if you guys are familiar that in 1912 it was a uh, uh, in 1912, an Australian farmer found an ancient bronze coin while digging for a fence. Uh, it was examined, and experts claimed that it was Egyptian from about 220 BC. Now, this I've seen this in a few magazines, uh, like Atlantis Rising. Mm. I've seen this in, uh, but you're not going to find anything like this in, in National Geographic or anything like that. But what, which, what we did find in National Geographic was King Tutankhamun's tomb. In 1922, excavated under the direction of Howard Carter, you all guys know, you've all heard or heard about King Tut and everything he found. What yep. they didn't expect to find was very aboriginal style mm. boomerangs mm. that were inside mm. inside the crypt. So we have, we even have stories of a marsupial skeleton that was found mm. in ancient in an ancient Egyptian. Now, the scholars dismissed that as well, and they did it very cleverly because the original news reports about that marsupial skeleton said it was a kangaroo, but it wasn't. 
it was a, it was some other type of marsupial field field rat or rodent and the scholars were able to dismiss that from the public by by telling the truth that it wasn't a kangaroo but the real truth was is that it truly was a marsupial and it was only native to the southern hemisphere so we have a lot of examples of academia just totally mm. dismissing stuff and they'll take it whatever whatever chance they can get yeah. but as you know as, uh, you know as australia you know it's the only continent that's also a country so it's not surprising to find that it also boasts of the largest agroglyph in the entire world i don't know how you guys pronounce it but it's mari man or mary man yeah it's m-a-r-r-e-e yeah. mary mary, mary man or something mary man yeah it's crazy but it look it looks just like a man who's about to use a boomerang it looks just like it's the largest agroglyph in the entire yep. world. Yep. Yep. yep, that one, yep. That's it right there. That's in Australia. Now, you have to understand, we have, we have, a, we have for hundreds of square miles in South America, starting at Nazca and stretching all the way to Pumapunka, Tiwanaku, Lake Titicaca, yep. we have these agroglyphs, but none of them are this size. Mm. There are spiders and dragonflies, man-shaped, alien-looking things, all kinds of flora and fauna, all these uh, really, really beautiful things. But there was a period of time in, in, in the ancient world that I'll get to here in a little while where these were very popular in civilizations everywhere. Even in the UK, they were doing them okay, yeah. in chalk hills, like, yeah. like the Cern Abish yeah. giant is only, is only one of them. There's also the snake eating the, snake eating the seed in... Uh, North America. It's a huge agroglyph of a snake that's made 3D. The hills, the hills themselves are mounds that look serpentine, and the snake's the snake's mouth is open, open wide, about to eat a seed or, or an egg. So the, they've been found, they've been found ubiquitously. I'm pretty sure that Europe and Asia can boast of some too. I just don't know offhand about them. But this is uh this is uh the sky facing agroglyphs that are famous like the CERN giant and the Nazca mm -hmm. lines, these were done for a very definitive reason. Academia dismisses some of them as a hoax. The one in Australia yeah. was dismissed yeah, yeah. as a hoax. Yeah, but, yeah, yeah. Uh, you can look at you can look at time, you can look at time release pictures of the one in Australia, and you can see where it was originally found, and then months later, the left arm, half of it's missing. And then you can look at pictures from about a year later and the whole missing. It looks like a very deliberate scrub. Then after a year, most of it was yeah. missing. So yeah, there's something, something happened in Australia about that, but we still have all the photographic evidence from the people that were in aircraft that took those pictures. So, so what, what kind of time frame yeah, well, are those glyphs from? Okay. In my Chronicon, I go through all this chronology and stuff. It was it was because of a, a very devastating Phoenix phenomenon cataclysm in 2647 BC. In 2647 BC, the ruling elite dynasties vanished. No one knows where they went or what happened to them, but the story and traditions are found ubiquitously. They're around, they're all throughout the ancient Americas and in, in Asia. They just left. The dry, all, all of them disappeared. Humans were left to fend for themselves. The gods, they considered them gods, although they, they weren't. They were more technologically advanced humans. In the air. These the air. humans knew they knew something was going on, going to happen, and they hid. When they hid, the people had to fend for themselves through a cataclysm. Survivors of that cataclysm in 2647 BC were left in a different type of world, and the first thing they did was employ what they knew best, sympathetic magic. It's a cargo cult type phenomenon. I'm going to explain cargo cult here, here in a minute, but uh, the uh, sympathetic magic was to draw these giant effigies in, in the ground, and because they had a belief that it would attract the gods back. If we draw, we know, we know that the gods liked monkeys, so let's draw a real friendly looking monkey, and let's put it all out. The survivors had had the benefit of being the descendants of people who were technologically advanced. They still had applied mathematics. They still had a lot of stuff. They just didn't have an infrastructure anymore. So they were able to lay out the measurements and get these get these right. But they're all sky facing for a reason, because the very people that had raised them and educated them and took care of them before the cataclysm, that's where they disappeared to. They just took to the skies. They were gone. So. 
uh, they disappeared from history and didn't reappear until after a, another cataclysm, which was centuries later. But in my Chronicon, I divide the vapor canopy world. It is the pre-flood world. Uh, for, those, for those who need a reference to this, the great flood of the Bible is the same thing as the Norse traditions, the day the sky mm -hmm. fell. The reason the great flood and the day the sky fell is the same event is because there was a watery mesosphere, a vapor canopy, and that vapor canopy world was basically the marsupial world. And we'll get to that here in a minute. And it's the reason why only in the southern hemisphere did marsupials survive. They they were they, the climate was totally wrong north north of the equator. But this, uh, this world had collapsed. In, in the biblical narrative, it's called the Great Flood. It wasn't a flood that flooded the entire world. It was flash flooding all over the world. There's a distinction because there were survivors in every culture around the world. They just had to hit the high ground. But during the vapor canopy world, as, as I'll discuss here in a minute, I have some slides for you to show you maps of what the world looked like during the vapor canopy. It was totally different. We have a world full of seas and oceans. We have to navigate and sail everywhere. But back in ancient times, there was nowhere you had to sail that was more than two days because everywhere it was a walk. You could trek overland almost around the entire world. So when the vapor canopy collapsed, that's when all these wingless birds, that's when all these marsupials of the southern hemisphere were cut off from each other. And only in the largest areas, because marsupials are, are very colonial type mammals, they're not like placentals. So these marsupials thrive when there's a bunch of them together, especially when there's not, there's no predator. They're also not. Uh, but we'll get to that. We'll get to that. Man. Vapor canopy was a dark world, but things grew to astonishing mm -hmm. sizes. And I, I discussed this in my in my, in my other uh, my other videos. So, so as well you know, as with the waters that that obviously came from the vapor canopy, but they also say it came up from below as well. Is that right? Yeah, well, geothermal heat would have would have, would have that would have had that would have been uh, fountains blowing up from underground everywhere. Yes, there, there's no doubt. I mean. Um, I'm pretty sure you're aware that the entire world is sitting basically on limestone caverns that are full of water. They're absolutely packed full of water. So, yeah, my cats, they're all blown. Uh, we don't sink because they're they're pretty far down there. But believe me, they're there. Yeah, there's all kinds of flus. But uh, there there is a simple fact as to why so many unique animal and plant species survived the, the collapse of the vapor canopy, which was the cause of this immense flash flooding that we're talking about. Uh, it's a sustained inundation and tsunamis, all these things overtook coastal regions. But let me show you this map. I got this map right here of what Australia would look like if the sea levels rose 230 feet uh, by your standard at 70 meters. Let me show you what Australia is going to look like if, if we had another vapor canopy today and it suddenly collapsed and all of a sudden the sea levels went up 270 feet. This is what Australia would look like. And this, and, and this basically taps directly in to a video I did on my channel explaining why on the next cataclysm, Australia is going to be prime real estate. This is Australia. Uh, yes. If the sea levels, the if same. the sea levels were increased by 270 yep. feet. I have this map too. Yep. What yeah. this tells us, what this tells us is unlike the rest of the world, Australia's elevations and its geography will protect its inhabitants from the flooding, from the tsunamis. There will be an inland sea created right there where you see it, but most of Australia is going to be okay. Yeah. It's going to yeah, be well, all that's right. That's not inhabited anyway. Wow. Because no. there's actually um, a map that looks like that, um, and it's dated. What's it dated? 1828, I think it's dated, that shows it, like a big inland sea. Like, like, I mean, one of my questions, just, just as a side note, is like with all these maps, do, uh, have we got the wrong dates? Do you think they're dated incorrectly? Because we just see. Oh, of course, of course, of course. So, yeah. See, here, here's the deal, man. Uh, I, 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 I'll entertain this tangent real quick. Uh, it's not going to take me too far off, off track. The, uh, listen, maps, maps could get you killed 600 years ago. If you were a navigator and your ship was taken by someone else and you didn't have a letter of marquee to show the provenance of a map, 
map where you got it because maps were relied on. It was a the captain was was responsible for the the life of the crew, and he was responsible. It was maritime law. Every single geographical feature you ever come across must be entered into the ship's log with with the the the, the closest of, uh, coordinates you can. Mar and listen, when ships when ships arrived in ancient ports, when I say ancient, I'm talking about 700 years ago, 600 years ago, 500, 400 years ago. Listen, their ship logs, these harbor masters, they had massive power. Harbor masters were just like intelligence agencies. They had the ability to go through every every ship's log that, that, that came into their harbor and docked. They were able to board any ship, go in there, look at all their maps, and these maps that were put together became very secret government projects. And when the Portuguese were mapping the entire, entire world, it was the Spanish that were at war with them. It was the Genoans that were at war with them. It was the English and the French that were at war with them. Everybody was hungry for information because everybody knew that the Portuguese had inherited all the maps of the Knights Templar. They knew that Henry the Navigator had all the information, the maps that were thousands of years old that had accurate topographies, and they wanted that. And uh, this is where this is the time period where the Portuguese and Henry the Navigator basically rebelled and the Knights Templar started flying what's called the Jolly Roger. This is the black pirate flag with a skull. It was, ba it was, basically, a, it was basically an FU we're not giving the, the information of because they had maps of Central America or North America. They knew where, the, where they knew where stone fortresses were located all throughout Texas, Louisiana, going up the Mississippi Valley. They had all that mapped out, but they weren't going to share it. So a lot of these pirate incidences that were that are recorded in history had nothing to do with actual piracy. It was the people in possession of these materials that were labeled as pirates, and then different governments and navies hunted them down. So this, uh, oh yeah, it's it's a fast. That's a fascinating. You know what? That piracy may be a video for you and I in the future, Campbell. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah, for sure. Yeah, the, interesting. Uh, it, Blackbeard. Yeah, oh, uh, I love Blackbeard. Englishman named Edward Teach, who finally had enough, and he just became a pirate. <laughs> yeah. But uh, so, but uh, yeah, the uh, Charles Hapgood Maps of the Ancient Sea Kings. This is a book in my library. I have it right here. But Maps of the Ancient Sea Kings is fantastic because it shows from the 1930s, 1940s, and 1950s. He shows that uh, all these maps that were in the possession of Cristobal Colon, which you know of as Christopher Columbus. Uh, Christopher Cologne had a bunch of maps. It's the reason why, even though it was known that he was Jewish, the, the House of Castile still funded his, his uh, deal, even though in the exact same year of 1492, they expelled 800,000 Jews from Spain in the same time that they funded him about America because he was the man. He had access to the maps that they wanted, so they funded him. But uh, anyway, like I said, hey, I'm gonna I'm gonna entertain those tangents. I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm no, just no, gonna take off. Good. Thank you. All so, right. So, uh, that's anyway, yeah. so, so every zoologist, every zoologist who actually knows what they're doing, uh, who specializes in marsupials, will tell you that almost 100 percent of all marsupials are nocturnal, and that's very interesting. Because not all mammals, by any stretch of the imagination, are nocturnal. Not all placentals are nocturnal. So why are all marsupials not nocturnal? Now, marsupials are very different than placentals. So it's a very different species of mammal. It's like a proto mammal. It's like they grew. It's like there were mammals that developed under an entirely different biosphere. And the species that are alive today of marsupials only made it, only survived because for thousands of years they were geographically located in an area with zero predators. The predators, like the dingo and all that, were introduced later. But we'll get to that. That's that's a whole other study. The dingo is not really native to Australia. It was an introduction. Yeah, from time. So, uh, yeah. yeah. So, anyway, what did, the, you call, uh, did you say placentals? Is that what? The yes, plus, oh, Okay. What are they? Okay, marsupials are a, a totally different class of mammal. All yeah. right, you and I are mammals. Dogs are ma dogs are mammals. Horses, yeah. bulls, goats, seals, whales—they're all mammals right. because they're they ha they're, they're the mothers basically have the baby in a membrane in a membrane sac and then once the baby is developed enough 
the sac is passed through the uterine wall and then a baby is born. And then the sac is removed by the mother. Dogs lick the sacs off their puppies, all that stuff like that. Okay, that's placentals. All right. It's almost as if mammals are a, a parasite. However, marsupials are simpler than that, but they have more complex biologies. Yeah, yeah. It's very unusual. The marsupial yeah. biology is tailored for a life in the darkness. It's also mm. tailored to survive extreme heat temperatures. And this is vapor canopy conditions. I've done several videos on the vapor canopy. And one of them is about all the Native American traditions about the vapor canopy world. And the common denominator about the American, the ancient Americans, they all said the same thing. There was no sun. It was a dark purple sky, but it was always hot. Mm. It's very hot. It was, a, it, was, it, was a, it was a canopy. So under this world it was different types of people different types of species different types of technologies there were still cities and all that but their technology operated in a different way than today we live in a different biosphere so so jace uh, jace are you putting this at about three thousand years ago where are you putting this timeline okay with the, with the, the vapor canopy the, okay the, the vapor canopy ended and totally collapsed after 16, at least 16 centuries, it was there in the historical record. It's called the Antediluvian mm. World. It collapsed in 2239 mm. BC in the month of May. It was a Phoenix phenomenon collapse. Now, something called something known in the ancient world as the Phoenix appeared in the sky. And whatever it did, it, it, it caused this whole canopy to just rain on humans for about yeah. 40 days caused flash flooding but it also began worldwide all the sun calendars because before that time the sun was unknown everything was lunar based and everything was stellar based all everybody's calendars during that time counted days every single turning of the stars around alpha draconis the eye of the dragon was a single revolution it was a single day days were counted in ancient times years were counted only after the collapse of the canopy mm, that actually times so i used to study under a teacher called Ramtha, and he tells his life story and he times with that he said that there was a vapor canopy over the whole realm that they never saw the sun that the stratosphere was pierced with a weapon and that brought down the canopy and then the floods came and that's what sunk lemuria in our wow. timeline i hey that's pretty interesting to me because uh my very very first video from a wooden shack on a tablet was called the phoenix weapon mm -hmm. from the very beginning it, uh, I've, I've treated it as a weapon because that's how it acts yeah. but uh, yeah that's he, really interesting yeah he said the weapon was crystal based and um um, they were basically, it was basically a weapon that they were using, um, fighting entities that were on in the realm of Mars. Okay. And um, yeah, and so they actually misused it. It pierced the stratosphere and um, brought the canopy down. And that was the first time they'd ever seen the sun and it also brought the snows and the that's flooding. Right. That's interesting. And sunk Lemuria and eventually every the, oh, the whole continent. Yeah. Wow. Well, when, mm -hmm. the, when the vapor canopy collapsed and you could put it in your mind we're talking about the great flood yeah. we're talking about ancient america the birth of the sun we're talking we're talking about in sumerian history the appearance of utu shamash utu Shamash was the very last Sumerian god to ever appear. Sumerian history was vapor canopy but at the very end of Sumerian history a new god appeared and they call him utu shamash and anybody who looks at a Sumerian uh, uh syllabary you'll see that utu and shamash both mean the sun mm. one is babylonian one is sumerian yeah but uh but yeah, that, that was just a whole new God. They just added a new God to their pantheon at the very end of mm. their civilization. Yeah, yeah, but when the vapor Christy canopy Andy. collapsed, the mm -hmm. when, when the vapor canopy collapsed, the placental mammals, they didn't adapt well or survive in Australia. We're talking about lions, tigers, bears. We're talking about raccoons. We're talking about the, the normal mammals that are around the entire rest of the world outside of New Zealand, outside of New Caledonia, outside of Tasmania, and outside of Australia. Mm -hmm. We're talking about the normal mammals that the rest of the world is familiar with. They didn't survive in the Australian, uh, uh, like the marsupials. The marsupials took to the night. They basically just switched their time, mm. their time yeah. over. But uh, yeah. being nocturnal, being nocturnal and adapted to heat, Australia was perfect for them. I'm telling you is is the marsupials were worldwide because the vo the vapor yeah. canopy was worldwide 
but they didn't survive. Just like the, the regular placental mammals like lions, tigers, and bears couldn't survive in the Australian outback and all that, the marsupials could. The inverse is, is true for, for the marsupials. They were worldwide too. We have marsupial fossils all over the world, but they're not, they're not all over the world anymore, except for one that has been that has been spread all over the world. And that's the opossum. But yeah, yeah. other than that, there's like there's like 400 different species of marsupials, and they're just right there in the southern hemisphere. So, yeah, uh, I always thought that was really interesting. Mm. Uh, I've done a lot of a lot of research on on the marsupials and all that, but uh, it's not just them. We'll, we'll get to the flightless birds too. But lowering the sea level to vapor conditions would make many islands much larger and shallows mm. to be above sea level. Just imagine it in your mind. The, much of the Pacific would be walkable, and the distances between islands and gigantic land surfaces, it'd only be one or two or three days sail. Easter Island in the South Pacific on, on the South American side is absolute proof that the sea levels have raised drastically because the gigantic heads on, on rock the island of Easter Island and the, would have required a massive forest and an island that is far larger than the one that is there now. The evidence, the infrastructure and architecture that was left behind shows a sedentary race, a race that was widespread and they came from their homes to do building and they did it at their leisure. They had workshops and tools were all laid out when the cataclysm occurred. When the cataclysm occurred, they dropped their stone hammers and their copper chisels. They dropped everything everything because that's exactly where archaeologists okay. found them in my mm -hmm. book when the sun darkens which was published in 2009 i have a lot about that i i discuss it for about two pages it's called ogaji and deluge but when it when the final destruction happened to easter island it was already it was already now a sacred site that people had to sail to 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 finish the building Mm. But originally, it was a huge mountain community attached to a city, just like Metallinum. I don't know if you know about the Ilap in the Carolines, but Metallinum is a basalt city that is completely underwater in the Pacific. But it wasn't built underwater. <laughs> you follow me? This yeah, is something. Yeah. This is something some of your your listeners can can uh, Google. You can Google. You can Google the the ruins of the Isle of Yap. It will blow your mind to see those pictures yeah, 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 of what's yeah, been yeah. found there. Uh, Japanese or ja Japanese archaeologists have found eight coins? foot tall skeletons in the 1930s. Oh uh, no, these aren't coins. They, these are they had basalt. The they built their entire all their structures were built out of basalt columns, octagonal crystalline basalt columns. We don't even know how you can lift something like that. A forklift would flip over trying to lift yeah. over one of those basalt columns. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, yeah, they, yeah they, that's yeah. in the Pacific though. And it yeah. shows it shows that we're only looking at a, at a Settlement that was at the top of a mountain. Well, now, Island, yeah. flightless birds. Most people ignore this enigma, but flightless birds. There's so many different kinds, but they're native only to the southern hemisphere. Many different species. Uh, can you guys hear me? Because it says my internet connection might yeah, be yeah. unstable. You, you we can hear you. Uh, yeah, no, you can hear you. Yeah. Oh, there you are. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, but they're only native to like the uh, the southern the southern hemisphere. Yeah. Uh, they didn't develop independently, but they did. So in a world where the land bridges were in place, all lands were connected in the Southern Hemisphere. Oh. The vapor canopy world was one gigantic land mass with, with lake seas and mm. rivers, just the opposite of mm. what it is today, which is almost all Oceania and just broken up with land. It wasn't like that. This is why you see these geometrical patterns in, in Indonesia. When you look at a map, you see like fingers coming off of Asia going mm. out into the ocean. All mm. those are ridge lines to ancient mountain ranges. And if you use your imagination and just put the water lower and lower, you'll see the land spread out. It was all dry mm. land at one time. Mm. But the marsupials, they may not have been native to the Southern hemisphere. There is evidence they were worldwide, but that's where they survived in the largest mm. concentrations. And wow. this too is a clue. In the Southern hemisphere, the insects, flora and fauna of the vapor canopy world, they died out north of the equator, but they continued to survive in the South. So did the flightless birds. They were worldwide too. Flightless birds and marsupials are so widespread in the Southern hemisphere because much of the landmass was passable land bridges until the day the sky fell. 
It was a Phoenix event that altered the sea levels and isolated Australia from the rest of the mm. world today. Yeah, that makes total so, sense because um, I've always understood that New Zealand and Australia were completely, you could walk to New Zealand from Australia. They're all interconnected. That we are in essence living on the highest points of the realm, that everything else is underwater. And you're right. I've always mm. known that the ridges are the mountains ranges and mm. that's been since the um the vapor canopy has disappeared yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Oh, well, well, the island thing too i was going to say is the story we get is that they were so stupid that they cut every single tree on the island down and that killed their society i mean that doesn't yeah, make sense. but what makes hey, sense I, I, is the I'm glad you knew down yeah that. that was a stupid <laughs> that was a very stupid description yeah, yeah right. right yeah but if all the forest got flooded then that makes sense yeah yeah here here's another Another map put out by somebody that shows what a world would look like if the sea level was lower. Yeah. Oh wow! Is that, uh, yeah, that is Australia in the middle there. Wow. Yeah, that's Australia, New Zealand. They're all connected. Yeah, all connected. They're all connected. Yeah. Yeah. They're all connected to Indonesia, and it's a two-day yeah. sail to Thailand. Wow. Yep. Yeah. Wow. Yep. 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 That makes sense. So we've been looking at the craters here in Australia and the realm. Um, which we've been taught were sort of meteor craters from long ago. But everyone we've studied, Jace, is like there's been no actual rocks. There's been no meteors. There's been no actual evidence of a meteor coming down. But they all seem to be um, functioning with as aqueducts, basically as Causes, giant plug holes. Yeah. And they, they've all got water coming up from underneath them, especially mm. here in Australia. So we assumed or made the started theorizing that the waters actually came up from underneath underneath okay. like giant plug I, holes well i can buy that i can buy that because i mean right here in the united states we have some that are absolutely geometrically perfect yeah, yeah. not a, it's not an impact and they don't even have the striations coming off of them that you see on the moon like impact yeah. deals so uh i i, I never really entertain that there would be water but there are references in many texts outside genesis that talk about the foundations of the great deep mm -hmm. and how the and how how the abyss has come to the surface so yeah, I can go with that, but even more so, I, I regard these giant holes as calderas. These are like massive outgassing when internal pressure is built up so much. When that internal pressure is built so much, it literally just explodes underground and it finds a, a way out. And when it does, it creates this tube that's several miles down and comes straight up to the surface, blows out, it's done outgassing. And once it settles, it turns into that beautiful mm -hmm. little bowl. And we've seen, mm. we've seen many of these. There's one in Arizona. There's a real popular one in Arizona called called a Mile Wide yeah, Crater. Yeah, yeah. Oh. It, it seems similar here in Australia, like um, because most of most of us are out in the what like it looks like just the flat desert plains now. But there's no there's no derbis around there. It's just like these round. Yeah, I mean, bowls is a good way of describing them. In the middle of these very flat, flat plains with no rocks or derbis around them so yeah. we've been we've been looking at them because of obviously australia being so like the the whole mass of the whole continent is now just desert deserted and very red sand very red the whole of the continent famous for being this red yeah. well, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna tell you i'm gonna tell you now you got a lot of that in 1902 a whole yeah. lot of it okay. 1902 yeah. But yeah. I, tell, I tell you what, let's move. Let's move real quick over to the Chinese. Y'all want to hear about say, the Chinese? Yeah, yeah. Can we just touch? Yeah, because quickly? we think yeah. Australia's always been China. China. Yeah, yeah. We've we, all, we went to um, we the been Chinese oh. museum in Melbourne, and we found out that the Chinese started the tobacco industry, the banana industry, the gold industry, the pearling industry. Pearl. Tin was it? Tin. Tin as well. Like all these industries. Basically, every fundamental you know, industry. Very we have early in, in our in our um history and and in very remote places like you know how did they know where the resources were so what do you got to say on okay that? so uh well i mean the china you you probably already familiar with the chinese presence in australia is uh it's academically backed by a very controversial author who put out a book called 1421 oh uh, you familiar with gavin menzies yeah. have you ever heard of gavin menzies okay well, look Gavin Menzies is not somebody that other scientists and academics can ignore. So he has not been attacked. They just regard him as an anomaly. But uh, let me explain. Gavin Menzies, 
uh, his very well-researched book. I read it about six years ago. It's the, it's a simple title, 1421, The Year the Chinese Discovered the World. So mm. he lays out he lays out his case. His book is about this thick. It's a it's a it's a fantastic book. But he lays out his case very scientifically with a lot of evidence. It's very compelling. But he cites a, a three thousand five hundred year old Chinese text describing the ancient Americas and what what is believed to be the coasts of Australia. The Chinese navigators three thousand five hundred years ago mapped it all out mm. and then never did anything else with the text. So. Uh, I, I can I can agree of the possibility because I have documented that uh, the Shang Dynasty Chinese fled their country after a Phoenix Cataclysm in 1135 BC, and they sailed to Central America, and they were later known as the Olmecs. It's not just a light theory. I cite chapter and verse from all these different scientific reports of all these specialists who basically agree that there was 250 thousand people who got on ships in 1135 BC and left because the mandate of heaven have changed in China, which means something happened in the sky and the people revolted because the emperor couldn't protect the people from, from what happened. Therefore, when the mandate of heaven changes, he's got to go. But 250,000 Chinese of the Shang dynasty went with him. Six months later, they reappear in Central America and they take over Veracruz State, Oaxia, and they become what we know of as the Old Mecca. Sounds like a fan fantastic story until you find out that all kinds of Chinese jade is found everywhere in Central America, Chinese statues, and now tablets with, with, with ancient Shang dy dynasty like uh, inscriptions. So a lot, there's a lot of scholars now leaning toward this now, but it's all attached to a Phoenix disaster in 1135 BC. Later, over 700 years after that, a Chinese fleet left. They escaped Kaluga Khan or Kaluga Khan. Kaluga Khan in 1291 invaded China, took it over, and a whole bunch of Chinese escaped, and they reappeared in ancient Mexico. So these are, uh, I just read this from a 270 year old book to my own subs on my own channel. I, I came into possession of a very old book on chronology and history. And I read that very passage to my, to my uh, subscribers. It blew my mind. It was, it was a historical reference that I had never heard myself about mm -hmm. that, uh, that happened in at the 700 years ago. I thought it was interesting, but the Chinese to me, they would have only visited, explored and departed lo a long time ago. Just as the Egyptians explored North America, as shown in the research of Barry Fell, William Corliss, one of my favorites, David Hatcher Childress. But the real mystery about Australia's most ancient inhabitants, the aboriginals, to me, it doesn't lie with China. Yes, the Chinese might have had a foothold there. Yes, the Chinese might have had a head start to do a lot of things. They're in that part of the world before the Europeans basically scouted the area out and did all kinds of stuff after a former civilization was already erased. But the real mystery to Australia, I'm going to tell you now, it comes from Dravidic India. Have you ever heard that? No. I've heard Go. that oh, you have the languages. I've heard that there's a language. Um, yes. There's yeah. linguistic studies now that show the ancient Vedic Sanskrit, uh, the, the language that was spoken when they read Sanskrit is very similar to the Ab old Aboriginal uh, uh, syllables. The way they, the, their sentence structure, syntax, all that. It's very interesting. That's, that's there is now DNA evidence. There's, there is now DNA English evidence. Looks similar, don't they, to, to Aboriginals? Maybe not the same coloring, but physically they are kind of, you know, tall they, and thin. They're identical. They're identical. Yeah. Okay, I, don't they're know why identical. Any, <laughs> I don't know why anybody has never made the connection before. Mm. I don't know why, because the Dravidian, Dravidian the dark, India yeah, was The dark a, Indian, yeah, yeah, for sure. Yes, it's the dark sure. Indian. Mm. There was always two cultures in India. One was light, one was very light colored, uh, almost, almost Mediterranean, uh, almost Near Eastern, and the other, the other Dravidians were always very, very, very dark and black, and they were only in the southern half of India, close to Australia. So, look, there is now DNA evidence. It's no longer theoretical. There's DNA evidence according to scientists in India, that the ancient Dravidians are indeed linked to the aboriginals of Australia. There are writers who are now claiming Dravidians departed India about 4,000 years ago and arrived to Australia. But the problem was, is the world changed and there was no way they could get back. There was no going back home. They were stuck there. So whether they joined with the aboriginals that were already in Australia is a very distinct possibility. Uh, 
or or if they remain distinct, it's just not known. Mm. Now, this would have been easy for the vapor canopy because it was a drier world. From India to Australia, 99% of the journey was an overland trek. Look at these maps. Ah. Look at this. Mm. Oh, mm. wow. Mm. Wow, okay. okay. You can see where Australia is? Yep. Yep. There's not a yep. single bit of there's not a single bit of water between Australia and India. Yep. Mm. You see that continent Lemuria way out in the Pacific? Yes. yes. Where Eastern Island was? That means really close to Australia was a whole nother supercontinent. Yes. This is what we would happen if you to pull if you pull all the water back and put it back in the mesosphere where it started. Way three, three and a half miles up, way up there, an ocean, a whole layer of atmosphere that's actually an ocean. So would they have Put been that water back. people as well? Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. During the vapor canopy, everything. Yeah. It's a, I have videos on my channel that explain the, the scientific research of, of uh, the Creation Research Institute from uh, Glen Rose, Texas. They built a biosphere and they replicated vapor canopy conditions and they made fruit flies, roaches, and beetles grow three times their, their normal size and live That's three amazing. times longer. Wow. Uh, okay. They right. did that in Texas. They did that in Texas. That's like well. the opposite to our theory, Campbell, because we were looking at the at it being um, an impact of a sun that people grew big, like as in plants today, and put them in the shade, they grow smaller, but the canopy... Like that's a, like there's no sun in that. It's just a very thick sort of biosphere, but, I guess. But there's, so that yeah, brings there's up life. a change in the atmosphere. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. So actually, actually, the under the vapor canopy conditions, the scientists in Texas were also surprised to find out that plants grow better in the dark mm. uh, under that ultraviolet light that would have passed through the vapor canopy than direct sunlight, which harms them. Wow, yeah, a, that's like the opposite to what we've been saying, Campbell. That's so interesting. Yeah, yeah excellent, yeah. excellent. Yeah, so, okay. So we continue with the Vedic deal because look, there's a uh, let me see here. There's a passage. Listen, there's a passage in the Vedic Ramayana that a bridge was formed between India and Sri Lanka yes. years ago, made by monkeys. Yes. It was made by monkeys. Now. It doesn't sound like that would that would relate to Australia, but check this out. I'm convinced the locals saw monkeys using it, using a natural land bridge to pass between the two land masses, and it was just assumed by the locals that monkeys made it. They probably just seen monkeys going out there in the ocean and then coming back, well, 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 whatever. And then that's what they assumed, and this tradition grew up out of that. But this is only referenced here to show that land bridges are indeed mentioned in ancient texts of India. That's just that's just one text. But the ancient texts of India are rife with empires and kingdoms and land masses that were off their coast that totally disappeared. Much of the Vedic literature is about these civilizations that are now underwater. Mm. And this passage from southern India to Australia over natural land bridges, when the sea level was much lower due to a vapor canopy, it's confirmed in two amazing finds that I've come across. You guys might know more, but there may be more, but statues found in Australia greatly resemble two Vedic deities. One is Hanuman and one is unmistakably Ganesh, the elephant deity. Let me show you. These are found in Australia. These are Vedic statues. This is the artwork of ancient India. Oh, the yeah. elephant, the elephant is Ganesh, yeah, yeah, Ganesh, yeah. and the other one is Hanuman. Where were they found, Jason? Oh, uh, you know, I don't know, I don't know the, what this place is called. It's called the Gimpy District of Queensland. Uh, Gimpy. Gimpy. There's yeah, a yeah. pyramid in Gimpy. Yep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. All right. Well, it says, it says they were found, they were excavated in, in Gimpy. In. Uh, I thought y'all would like that, but I, I wanted to show that the archaeology confirms tradition and tradition confirms the geography and geography is confirmed by the genetic testing. Everything points to ancient India now. Well, wow, fascinating. We have never had, mm. we've had a few elders on the show and no one's ever, ever made a link to India ever, have they? No, yeah, well, that's no, a fascinating no. thing to, for us to talk to no, about I mean, getting on some of our indigenous. Yeah. thinking because the, the Australian originals always say that they're the oldest um 
you know, civilization. People, civilization. Yeah. But so does so does the Vedic tradition, right? They say the yeah. same thing. They do say the same thing. They do mm. say the same. Look, but but the situation, the situation under the vapor canopy was more complex, though, than just land bridges. The legends and memories from that part of the world, the southern hemisphere, they're right with stories of fantastic supercontinent, uh, a kingdom called Lemuria or a continent. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's called Mu. Other times yeah. in ancient Vedic texts, it's called Kumari Kandam. And it's a vast landmass that was yeah. populated by the ancient, ancient Tamil civilization. It's the Atlantis of the Pacific is what it is. Yeah. I'm going to show you this book. This book is by David Hatcher Childress. It documents a wide variety of artifacts, archaeological anomalies, legends, ancient texts. Uh, uh, it's just fascinating. This is one of my favorite authors because he goes to the very places that he talks about. But this book needs to be read by everyone. Lost Cities of Ancient Lumeria in the Pacific. This book. Oh, yes. Hold on. I've seen it. Hold on. It'll, yeah. focus, it'll focus in. It'll focus in. Yeah. I don't know why. I don't know why my, my screen is not focusing right. There it is. There it is. Yeah, we got it. We got it. Right there. Screen shot that one of the best books you'll ever read let me tell you something this man will teach you things about new zealand tasmania and australia you've never heard before yeah no. this uh david hatcher children's wrote a real fascinating book but it's a uh, new guinea australia new zealand new caledonia look they were attached to the tonga islands where there have been found massive dolmens trilithons mm -hmm. ancient megalithic architecture and islands that are isolated and yet they're populated with people now, what I just showed you on this picture, New Caledonia, uh, it has 400 unnatural hills made of ancient cement that remain a mystery. I'm going to show you this. Mm. This is a true archaeological find. This is vapor canopy technology here. I'm going to show you. You were talking about, fly, about flight. Yeah. Well, things that fly require power yeah. sources. So let me show you something. This, all that looks like to a casual observer, in New Caledonia, all that looks like oh. is 400, like, tumuli or tumuli, however you say it. These are hills. Now, it was very unusual. And for over 100 years, nobody really thought to even look at them because they thought they were burial grounds. That's what they thought they were. Somebody had buried giants, these big old hills. But that's not what they found. So when they found, I'm going to show you what they found. And what they found inside is so anomalous that they had to dig up another one. Then they dug up another one. Then they dug up over 40 of them, and they confirmed, okay, yeah, you know what? Every single one of these have the exact same construction inside. What hasn't been explained today is what the hell is it? I'm going to show you. Okay. This is one of the first illustrations done over 100 years ago of the inside of a hill. Mm. Now, somebody used, somebody was very specific in putting, it was cement. They know it's cement because it has snail shells in it. It's been mixed, it's with lime and mortar. Somebody that. made this. The only problem is it's dated 5100 BC. It's dated 7,000 years ago. Now, all 400 hills look, look basically like this, but I'm gonna go into more detail now. Later scientists, later scientists went and looked at them, and they got a much better analysis. This is what they look like inside, each one of them, 400 of them. Now, that's anomalous. That's anomalous. Mm. Well, what but was that what's bit more mysterious is we have absolutely no, there's no traditions, there's no records of a civilization here in New Caledonia. And the excavations re reveal cement cylinders laid in gravel, vertical, layered in rings of iron nodules. Listen, oh. the discovery of these small snails proves that it's a mixture made by people, by, by men. These weren't, these weren't, this is, there's nothing natural about this. The structuring of these mounds suspiciously looks just like the Baghdad battery found in Iraq, which actually produces 70 volts of electricity. And that's now. We don't know how much it did back then when you actually packed it with all everything you needed for the compost. But yeah. here's 400 batteries, charging stations, way out in New mm. Caledonia. Uh -huh. Remember remember David Hatcher's theory about the Viminas? They needed to charge and they needed to stop somewhere and then before they made the trip all the way over the Pacific. So it's a 
Yeah, it's dated at 5100 BC, but this would be a vapor canopy type technology. I believe I believe that discoverers pretty much know what it is, but they just it's so unbelievable they're not publishing it. So it's just because wow. it's there, just there, such an, an anomaly. island, isn't there? In um, uh, I can't remember what the island is, but it's covered in jars. Yeah, I've seen that too. Yeah, yeah, I've seen I mean, that too. Could be the same kind of thing possibly too. yeah wow so uh here, so here's something really interesting you remember you asked me a question uh you asked me a question earlier what time period are we looking at when we were talking about this this uh disaster and when they when they drew these giant agroglyphs so because the to them the gods had, had yeah. abandoned them and they totally left so they so they were employing sympathetic magic to to try to draw the gods back down okay you asked me and i told you the date was 26 26 uh, 47 bc which was a phoenix year it was a phoenix cataclysm it was known to come and that's why the elite vanished they were gone and they left behind all these other people to fend for themselves okay you, you, you can imagine my surprise when I was basically just going through different websites because I don't really use the internet for a source of material at all. But I was just going through different websites, seeing just basically what was the general creation story for the Aboriginals? What did they believe in their ancient past? Man, look in my study. Look in my studies on Australia. I came, I came across the, the, the research of scientists at the University of, of New South Wales. I didn't want to quote anybody outside of Australia. You know what I mean? I wanted to stick. These people would know best that, that, because they're, they're, I mean, they're, they're there, geographically there. So, but they had collected a lot of Aboriginal traditions and pieced together that, that basically the Aborigines had described to them a cataclysm involving the sun yeah. that happened 47 centuries earlier. And they described it as a fire devil that crashed to the earth. Now, this astonished them because one, evidently, the sun wasn't very well known. And there wasn't any, and it wasn't believed that anything could come from the sky that was fiery. Now they don't ever say vapor canopy. They don't ever say that there was a, a firmament above made of all that water. But the but the but what these scientists have concluded makes sense. Why the Aborigines would have been in such disbelief that something made of fire could have fell from the sky. But the date was forty seven centuries ago. That is within thirty years of 2647 BC when that Phoenix cataclysm, you know, when, it, when you're talking about scientific estimates, that's a bullseye because most of the time in anthropology, they're going to say plus or minus one or 200 years. Mm. That's a scientific bullseye. This, this Aboriginal tradition about, about the, I mean, and, and to them, that would be the great, the great disaster. Cause remember, remember now put things into proper context. To the Aboriginal, the last great cataclysm was it during the vapor canopy when something fiery fell from the sky, caused a disaster, and all the individuals that they looked up to, builders of infrastructure, all what they considered was gods, vanished and left them and abandoned them. To them, that was their nightmare. But later, 552 years later, was the great flood, the day the sky fell, the collapse of the vapor canopy. But the Aboriginals didn't fear that date. There are no flood traditions in ancient Aboriginal deal. Why? What did I show you about Australia? Mm -hmm. Australia mm -hmm. is like a refuge from cataclysm. It is the place you need to be when the Phoenix phenomenon does these major events all over the world. Australia is a haven. Aboriginals had no idea there was a great flood. There was a day the sky fell. They didn't know anything about it because Australia was unaffected. The absolute proof Australia was unaffected is the fact that there's over 200 and something species of marsupials that are there cannot be found anywhere else in the entire world. Nice. Mm. Nice. So that's interesting because we've, um, I've always understood that Australia sits on a very unique platonic plate and that we actually uh, make up the ring of fire and any sort of movement on these platonic plates would cause massive, you know, catalysms around this continent. So a mass massive floodings. So that sort of, plate shift actually is protective for australia protects us versus um breaking it apart yeah it's a there's something about the geography i mean you saw that map when, yeah. you, when you add look 200 look, if you add if you just add 20 feet 
of sea level? Do you have mm. any idea how many cities around the world will be completely flooded out? Destroyed, yeah. yeah. Whole subway systems and yeah. underground yeah. infrastructures, all their power, everything, telecommunications will be all completely knocked out. That's that's 20 feet of coastal cities all around the world. But Australia's barely affected even at 270 feet, ocean, the ocean level rises. Mm. So, yeah, it's, yeah, Australia has very unique geography. Yeah, right. Because mm. interesting, we're, interesting. We're, we're a high land mass. I mean, not the Great Australian Bight is basically a big cliff, isn't it? So, well, the Great Dividing Range—that's like a whole, you know, mountainous range. Sort of, that's about. I would say that's about two hours inland of of, of the coastline, all around Australia, almost. Mm. Certainly yeah, from yeah. Queensland right through New South Wales to Victoria. Good point. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. All right. So well, I, I know all these places. You guys mentioned these places, like. New South Wales and Victoria and Queensland. Yeah. I know them because I've been mailing. I've been mailing packages to all over Australia, so, <laughs> and I don't know where these places are. I haven't really looked on a map to see them. I just know their names now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I have to come down one day. Yeah. Um, so okay, you mentioned okay. 1902 mm. and um, the red dust. Obviously, Australia is the red continent. Yes. So, yeah. Yeah, I think I think I might have mentioned it too when when you and Howdy and I were on, but uh. Yeah, um, Charles Ford in the 1930s published the, the Book of the Damned. Then he followed it with Low in the New Lands and uh, 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 Strange Talents or something like that. But he had amassed all the scientific reports from 1901 and 1902 and 1903 where something very anomalous happened. And scientists were baffled that not that first the first thing that was seen was astronomers were looking at red dust veils that were passing through what they said was the inner solar system. Now, I believe the sky is totally 100% simulated, but that, but that simulation doesn't mean that astronomers that have bought into the lie are not actually seeing phenomena that's being projected for them to see, because the sky is sentient. It is very, very, uh, it, it's full of trickery, and it will produce the phenomena that you expect to observe. And these astronomers have been documenting since the 1700s all these things that they see. And when one astronomer publishes a report that, hey, Saturn has rings, now all of a sudden, other astronomers look in that area, they look at that luminary, and they look through it, and as they study it, they start rings of Saturn. Then they begin to publish it, and they confirm that. Then it's peer-reviewed by other people who study it, and then say the same thing, that Jupiter has like 27 moons, or well, other astronomers confirm it after they study it. It's because the simulacrum itself, this, this sky holography, feeds them the very imagery, imagery that they're searching for. So, uh, as this continues on, we build this great massive body of fallacy that we call astronomy, and we perpetuate it, and, we, and people who have never looked through a telescope now believe all these things are true about the sky, and, and, and I mean, it's okay, I, I don't care if people believe it or not, but in 1902, astronomers were looking through telescopes, well, actually in 1901, they were looking at telescopes, and they saw red dust veils coming toward earth from venus and they documented that and and then some of them wrote them in as nebulae they didn't really know what it was then all of a sudden in 1901 red sand started raining on american cities then red sand started falling on european cities throughout 1902 in the month of february march april may june july and august red mud red sand red rains fell all over the world and documented everywhere i have my own my own uh, uh, subscribers are always sending me uh, little little pieces of newspaper from 1901, 1902, 1903 that they see in their their local archives or you know the microfish. Uh, yeah, it's a uh, 1902 has become a a a really a topic of fascination for a lot of my subs. They they are always sending me unique things that they found out about 1902 that I never covered in my two published books about it or in I got like 41 or 42 Phoenix videos. I never covered it. I have five videos on 1902 and I, I listed a lot of the anomalies that happened in 1902, but my, my subscribers have sent me far more than I ever found myself. And they've been pretty engaged in that. But uh, yes, there were these these uh scientists studied these under microscope. This 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 dust, and and it depends on what samples were taken. But in every single incident, they contained organic compounds. 
Uh, in, in Rome, scientists were swearing it was blood. They said it had corpuscles in it. It's some type of blood. Now, uh, organic materials falling from the sky is nothing new. Same thing happened in 1347. In 1347, all the locals said that cigar-shaped objects appeared in the sky, opened their bellies and dropped decomposed and chopped up bodies of stags, pigs, raccoons, squirrel, all kinds of forest animals had been like run through a blender and then just let to, let to decompose in some type of holding cell. And then once they were fetid and rancid and full of disease, they were dumped in the forest. And these are, these are the actual historical accounts that were written down in 1347 concerning the origin of the great black death plague however in the history books our teachers have told us that rats carrying fleas from china aboard wooden ships brought the plague from china to eat to europe and it's total bullshit that's not mm -hmm. the truth i go by i go by what the historians were saying that were alive at the time and not what they were being told today so organic materials being fallen from the sky is nothing new. Charles Ford documented many of them. But in 1902, which was the last year of the Phoenix, this is what happened all around the world. And in some incidents in, in Oceania, there were ship captains that had to call all hands on deck just to push with brooms and, and whatever tool they could find all the red mud off the off their ships before their ships capsized and these are these are written in 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 the uh, captain's logs that's how bad it was and australia was one of the hardest hit for this red dust phenomenon in 1901 and 1902 so, so jay so what what have you how are you explaining the red dust what 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 explanation has that got well uh, I am not on board with the the media's the media always says that Sahara dust uh, is the explanation for when Chinese cities have this red dust falling on when American cities when the cities in Europe have this red dust it's, it's been happening in the past two or three years several times Australia has the red dust coming and the media is always going to tell us the story that the red dust is kicked up from from the deserts yeah. of, of what, whatever's convenient if it's yeah. the tackling Mac and desert that's closest to it they'll blame that one if it's the sahara even deserts with yellow sand have been blamed for red dust yeah storms. so no i believe that this stuff is coming from the sky i i don't know where it's coming from the sky but but i have always told the people on my channel that the sky is simulated and it's hiding something else what you see is a really there but the evidence the mechanics of the sky have been observed in different times like in 1566 in 1561 when it seems like the sky sim suffered a power failure. And I have videos about that too, what Europeans witnessed and what they saw and what the woodcuts show us that were drawn at the time because people couldn't process what they saw. It was so inexplicable. It's like giant machinery in the sky. But then the power source, I guess, came back online and, and it, these things are quickly forgotten because they can't be explained. Okay. But uh, they're, entered into, they're entered into the historical record and uh they're just they're just left left as little side notes in different old books and stuff. That's fascinating because it was only yesterday Campbell and I were like talking about the floating city concept. And we're just like, we know we know fucking nothing about the sky. Nothing. We have no understanding of what the sky is or what it really is. So to actually have this conversation with you today and hear you talk about it being a simulation, we've totally on board with that. So I I didn't even know that there was actually historical records where it actually like turned itself off. And people saw yeah. past the simulation. And you're saying that they saw machinery. Well, they they don't know what they saw because the frames of reference in 1566 and 1561, yeah. Yeah. they don't know what they what they were looking at. Yeah. Uh, in, in, 17, in 1752, something similar happened, and the people could only describe it as what it geometrically looked like to them at the time. And it looked like the sky was filled with an octagonal star, and that that octagonal star started spitting fire at them, and some of these flames hit different areas on the ground. So don't know so we have to when we when we research things in ancient history and more contemporary times it's always best to to try to interpret these these things from the frames of reference that were known at that time uh, i'll give you an example uh today we talk about alien aliens and crop circles okay but the exact same thing was happening in 1688 when somebody had carved a woodcut because they were astonished that in their cornfield a 
crop circle had appeared and they saw devils dancing in the ring. But 300 years before that, they were described in, in, in Viking tales and it was always elves or dwarves that were making these, these rings and stuff. These crop circles, these agroglyphs have been happening for thousands of years, but they're always described only by the frames of reference yeah. that are most well known to that civilization. Mm. Today it's aliens. Aliens are doing it. Or, or or harp technology. The government's doing it with satellites. You're going to hear everything but the truth. It all goes by frames of reference. But it's some other type of technology that's being incorporated here. It's a communication technology. Somebody is sending messages, and the best way to do it is through geometry. That's what they're. That's what these crop circles are about. That's why they get more and more elaborate. But about your cities in the sky, uh, I had recently told told uh, the listeners on my channel that I had read a military report. And I have it in my notes. I've cited it in Chronicon, but it's very strange. These, this is not something I typically record as a chronologist. I had to do it because at the time I was a Christian, at the time I believed 100% the infall- the, uh, that the Bible was, 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 was the word of God. And I, be- and I believe it is a holy book, but I believe it's a, a book of good and evil. It's up to you to find it. Now, I also, I, at the time, I processed information differently, but I had put this aside because it was so anomalous and it's an incident of the U S air force where they're describing a non-combat mission over the Pacific and a B 52 with about five guys on board was a skeleton crew. They were going over the Pacific and they crashed into an invisible barrier. And when the U S and when the, when the, when the Navy found the remains of the ship, it looked like the tail had just been crunched all the way to the nose. Mm. Everything had been, it, it, whatever it hit, it had no yield. It was like a force field. It just hit it. There are things in the sky, little anecdotes like this. I keep these and I, because I may not be able to build them into a narrative historically, but I have to keep them because they've got to be a part of my paradigm. I have mm. to be able to incorporate everything. And that's why two years ago, I totally wrapped all my research around simulation theory. The archaics data stands alone. I don't need simulation theory to put out my material, but on a personal level, which I don't mind sharing with people on a personal level, I have to tell people that I'm a simulationist because there's nothing else that can put all this wide diversity of data into a cohesive understanding, unless I'm understanding that this is all a computerized fiction. Nothing else makes sense. Mm. Yeah, yeah, there's too, yeah, there's too much. Um, I mean, can you, <laughs> can you imagine actually like seeing the fucking sky turn off and I like, know, right? like, can you imagine the head fuck that would be for everyone? Like just today, <laughs> like going out and seeing <laughs> the sky off yeah. and like, and what's behind it? I mean, that is just a whoo, fucking bizarre? awesome concept. <laughs> and like, yeah, I just love it. Right. I mean, yeah. <laughs> so, so just as a side talking note, about that missing. if it's a simulation do you have any thoughts on like where the edge is like, like is it antarctica or are we just in a in a confined area of and then the rest ah, is, good, is it contained good yeah. question yep well oh i told i i made i've made it very clear on my own channel that my research is chronology based you know, and yeah, yeah. I also make the distinction many times between fact and opinion. Because yeah. there are many things that I assert as fact because I can show my sources and I can show the math. Yep. Yeah. But when it comes to a question like this, yeah, I have to exactly. tell you I have a suspicion. I have a suspicion. The flat earthers are right as far as the perimeters of our of our of our world and why we can't go farther. And I believe that insiders in the military industrial complex are are actually protecting us they're actually keeping us from finding out the actual truth because if the entire world actually found the whole truth once ants find out they're in an ant farm they don't don't act normal anymore Mm. they're gonna all they're gonna do is try to find Mm. a way out Mm. now i believe that we might have done that with operation fishbowl uh we might have done that we might have we might have attempted it several times but we probably have a pretty good understanding 
because uh, the military industrial complex is worldwide. It's multinational. It's not against each other. Yeah. Wars aren't what you think yeah. they are. Yeah. This, these war, wars are ways for banks to transfer the wealth of nations. That's what wars are for. It's the only. It's the only reason wars are even fought. It's to transfer the, the wealth of nations mm -hmm. illegally. It's when the collective wants to cannibalize a, a country or two or three countries. They invent the reason and then they use a war to rape them yeah. of all their resources. Yeah. That's what they do. So what about um what about the theory conceptually that the way out is down through the ocean and up out past the realm past the the container? A, I mean that's a that's a beautiful concept, uh, and it might be the true reason why we have so many submarines always patrolling. I don't know. It's just nothing I would ever know. It's I, I know that we can't. I know we can't go very deep. I mean, even our submarines can't go very deep. Pressure alone just totally implode. So. Uh, I don't know. I just, but I do know that our world is mm. vast, and just because I admit that we live under a, a solid vault that produces a holographic field that makes me believe in a cosmos, but it's actually a solid vault like a dome. Just because I believe that doesn't mean the world is small. No, God no. Because <laughs> the world is still quite vast. We can. It's a long way or uh, from you know from east to west. Or from north to south, it's still a long way, and we are so microscopically tiny that the only reason why we even have an inkling of an idea that the world is saleable or the world is travelable is because we have this technological infrastructure that makes us all one community, like the internet. Without the internet, without being able to find all these things, like the world would be a very gigantic place. People would be attached to their communities and not to an international. Uh, a family and that's the way it would be so and, and that's the way it will return it's going to come back the internet hasn't always been here and i do believe that it, uh i do believe that we have been set up for failure as soon as as soon as people are almost 100 percent reliable on it it will be taken from us you know i believe it's all by design <laughs> but. all right all right all right so like just let me go back to um the red sand because i actually lived through there was one one sort of like maybe eight or 10 years ago here in Australia. And I actually lived through that event. And I was just in Newcastle at the time. It was outside of Sydney. And this, we woke up and the sky was, the whole atmosphere was yellow. And then you moved, uh, we at, drove to Sydney, which is about an hour and a half, and everything was red. And it's not just the sky. It was like the very atmosphere, the very context of our version of air was coloured. And then we... We actually, it was just a random day. We were actually traveling and we drove through Sydney and out and actually started hitting some of the rural communities and they were reporting it being blue and being green. So there was like this massive, like in one, this is in one day and this is like a massive event. Do you remember it, Campbell, when that it was massive? The whole of I'm, Sydney was bright yeah, I remember red. the pictures from Sydney. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I was actually there in that experience and traveling through it. And it was actually being reported as different colours on that one day. Wow. And wow. so now I'm fascinated to consider the idea that that was coming down from the sky because it made no sense. Their story about it being, you know, dust from the desert coming in was ridiculous. When I was travelling, I actually was going through it. But the idea of it coming down the sky, the sky being a simulation. So what would the context of that that dust be? Oh, that's that well, red, I can, I can, you call it sand? I will let you, I will let your imagination run yeah. with that. And I'll just, I'll just give you some more context. Listen yeah. to this. Mm. We mm. have scientifically documented in, 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 we're talking about the polar regions where there's nothing that can grow. It's only ice. Yes. And yet ship captains have reported that frozen cricket crickets and cricket larvae were in the hundreds of thousands were all over the ice and some of them were still kicking like they just fell out the sky how did they get there roaches earthworms and all that have been found encased in layers of ice as it fell out of the sky in 1867 1868 and 1869 the uk suffered a storm of insects they had to employ chimney sweeps through all throughout all throughout Britain just to sweep the carcasses of the bugs and burn them because the plague broke out from the decomposition. 
But ship captains that were in between France and Britain were reporting rivers of insects falling out of a blue sky. Mm. So it's a, <laughs> yes, we have, we have incidents, we have incidents where the sky is producing all this material. We don't know why, but there's layer, there is layers and layers and layers and layers in this world, but we're seeing more evidence those layers are deposits, not from water, from deluges and in, in, this, in millions of years of geography, but from a massive dump from the sky for whatever reason. This is why so many ancient ruins have been found 60, 70, and 80 feet below ground, but there's no record of, uh, of any time period of when it became down there. We have found many, many civilizations that were just so deep. Like, I mean, there, there's one in uh, central Mexico for which the academia has done a great job covering up. But the archaeologist William Niven in 1907, 1908, 1909 excavated pyramids, pyramid cities, uh, uh, all kinds of amazing stuff in Central, in central America near Acambaro. And when he discovered mammoths, mammoth skeletons inside the tombs of some of some of these uh, uh crypts and stuff they shut him down they went in there they kicked him out of mexico they, they totally shut him down when he, he found written tablets in ancient mesoamerican dialects or languages that they never they couldn't decipher but they were in the same chambers as mammoth bones as soon as he discovered something that was totally against the evolutionary mm -hmm. idea of progressive mm -hmm. development and natural selection as soon as he showed that pyramid cities may have existed in an ice age type time with the megafauna they shut his ass down and he's not the only one. These sites have been been shut down all over the world. Mm -hmm. There's a toxodonts and elephants have been found inscribed in Central American and yeah. South American ruins, but yeah. they've been removed. There are people like Colonel Fawcett and other people have documented these things from the 1920s, 30s, 40s, and 50s. They did pen and ink illustrations of them. out. That's how they used to document everything in archaeology. They always carried an artist with them, or sometimes the archaeology was the artist. The archaeologist was the artist. But But now... When people visit those ruins, there's no evidence of elephants and elephant trunks and all that because they're not native to the Americas. Therefore, the establishment doesn't want you to know about all the transatlantic voyages and the fact that ships were capable mm. of carrying elephants back there. Well, that makes so much sense. And um, I, my, the first book I read that really opened my eyes up to my love for history was Forbidden Archaeology, like a long, long time ago. And um, and from that moment on, the whole, you know, narrative Collapsed. But like, can I just ask you, so when you, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm going back to the, set, the red sand um, falling from the sky, because well, as you talk, what I feel, what I think is blood and bone, like fertilizer, like a, like a substance of biology basically coming in, because we're getting obviously a lot of reports today of the skies turning red all the way through China, particularly China. And that's like flooded my feed for the last sort of 12 months. You too, Campbell, have you been seeing those reports of the red skies yep, yeah, yep. yeah 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 so you know the idea of it being sort of like a biology that's being rained yeah. down mm -hmm. to sort of like complement uh, yeah, yeah. yeah 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 potentially laying the foundations for um i don't know like a a, a new laying the foundations for um what is to come next maybe i mean it's definitely and have you found jace that within history have these sky events happened at like at certain times or have yeah, they just yeah. read all the way through history like well, are they clumped together oh uh, if you're talking about the 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 phenomena of the red dust and red mud that yeah i have only found those to be worldwide every Every 138 years it's a very right. it's a very definitive timeline however okay yeah. uh, however in the 1800s and in the 1600s i found several incidents but they were always highly localized like you're describing now here it is mm. 2022 we're still 18 years from the next phoenix year and yet there's red skies are happening so i've seen a lot of these like egypt 1447 bc the exodus the river the nile river yes, turned red as yes. blood but we have we have we have many incidents in Pliny's natural history 
from the years 200 to 100 BC of, of the Tiber River in Rome turned red as blood. So there, there's also been blood rains all throughout Roman history. There were many times where there were blood rains that shut down the government. Uh, they, they, they accepted that as an omen from the books of the Sibyl. And they, they, they refused to work and do administrative stuff because it was a sign from the gods that, that, that the gods were upset. So they sent a blood rain. Now, as far as your idea that this could actually be blood, I... I can see no departure from that. I don't like to talk about it because I'm not really, a, I don't want to be a doomsayer. Sayer. I don't want, I mean, for now, now we have to jump. Now we have to jump. We have to make a cognitive leap. Where's the blood coming yes. from? <laughs> what is it from? What, what life forms lost their life in order for that to happen? If that's in, indeed the case, because now, now, now we're opening up a can mm. of worms. You know, mm. of course, now we're opening up a can of worms that makes us, have to go back into the original creation myths of many different cultures because that's a common denominator. Not a common denominator mm, is that in ancient right, times the human right, race yeah. was made from the blood of a yeah, god, yeah, yeah. or the blood of a, god, or the yeah. blood of a titan, the blood of a giant. No. So, so now it opens up a whole other can of worms. About I mean, it's really it's really hard to process. For, it's really hard for people to process that actual blood is falling from the skies, even though we've had scientists declare that. Mm. Well, I mean, it's no, I mean, I can't ignore that, like, in the last two years, as we've gone through the last sort of two years, like, the whole um, focus on the adrenochrome running through the channels, that was all about blood. Um, and that was, like, really exposed for the last two years. So that's just something, side of side note to this conversation. Mm. Lots of, oh, and, lots um, of blood talk. Yeah. yeah. Lots of blood and references we know coming about through. Blood sacrifice. I mean, blood is definitely a theme that, that that's connected to gods and all this kind of stuff, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, we don't even know if it's the actual material that we're talking about. It could actually be something to do with the color itself. It could be the the color frequency that's actually being like Red spread. Shift. There could yeah, be a connection there. Happened. Like it's very three D of us just to think it's the actual matter that's what that's we're focusing on. It could mm. be so much more. It could be the you know the cymatics, the frequency, the vibration of this um, this substance, this thing. Could, could just be I don't fertilizer. know the right word for it. <laughs> could just be fertilizing the garden. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> have you guys yeah, have I you mean, guys seen that movie Night of the Comet from the eighties? I haven't. No. I've, heard, I've heard you mention it. Night, but, um, yeah. I think yes. I well, I, I'll make a note. I mentioned it to J Dreamers, yeah. and he did a fantastic breakdown of the movie. All right. But, uh, let's check that yeah, out. it's all. Yeah. Uh, but 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 it, but it's, it goes in line with what you're talking about. It's uh, in the beginning of the movie, these people are hiding underground. They don't know that they're underground. They're in a World War II bunker that was turned into a movie theater, and they're in there and they're protected from this comet. When the comet passes over, everybody's outside waiting for the comet. The whole world's partying. They're all waiting, and when the comet passes over, Earth goes into the tail of the comet, and every single person that's exposed to it on the surface is reduced to red dust and all you see is their clothes all you see is their clothes and their watches and their rings it's red dust everywhere so the people that were deep in the subway systems and underground and in high-rise buildings underground they come out the next morning and find new york city completely empty and there's piles of red dust and, and clothes all over the city and it takes them a while to figure out a couple people were exposed they turned to mutants and stuff but but through through the through the movie, you figure out real real fast that the government knew that something was going to happen. They were already waiting in underground facilities, and they start rounding up survivors. Because but, we, uh, the, the movie's called Night of the Comet. Yeah, I'm cool. totally going to watch that. Yeah. So, like, because we don't know what's actually happening. I mean, we don't know what the sky is. We don't know what's happening above or what's past that simulation. You know, like the event that we're seeing could just be the remnants. The results are something that's happening above the simulation. Right, right. I'm, I'm, I'm not. I'm not. I'm not in the party of of thinking that this is a bad situation. Mm. And what I, what I mean by that is that I used to be all about intruder planets, the apocalypse, doom, saying all. That. I used to, but the deeper that I study these materials and the more my intuition, my empathy, and my imagination take off, and I realize 
this whole experience is more spiritual than physical. And I often fear, fear things by concept, even though I never actually suffer those circumstances. And the more, the more I cogitate and I, I think about all these, all these discoveries that I've put together and I have made, and I hear from other people. And as we put these pieces together, that, that would, would on the surface be harrowing. The more I, I examine all this, I'm like, man, this is a game. Mm -hmm somebody didn't want me to realize that there really isn't any danger here in that I'm just developing something. Maybe my personality, maybe, maybe I'm just an immortal trapped in this husk and the, and, and, and the true oversoul just didn't want me to know that I was actually safe and that all this is illus illusory and that I'm in no real danger and that all these harrowing deaths that I see other people go through and all that. And in actuality, they exit their avatars before they actually yeah. feel any yeah. of that. So, I mean, I have personal experience with this. I mean, I, I had, I had a motorcycle accident that should have killed me instantly. I'm telling I flew 65 feet through the air off my Harley Davidson, which is a thousand pounds. I got a fat boy. I got one of the big bikes and uh, I flew upside down 65 feet and I, I had a body impact on a concrete pylon and rebar went right through my arm and tore my tattoo wow. out. So, uh, yeah, I, and, 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 but it was one of the best experiences of my life. And I, I did a video about it, explained to my, my subscribers that mm -hmm. uh, I did one YouTube video about the Phoenix one a couple weeks later, I had a motorcycle accident a year later. I wrapped all my research around simulation theory behind that incident, behind behind how I felt and saw other people and how awesome it was. I didn't know I was hurt. I had a vague idea that I, I, I was hurt. I knew I'd been in an accident. I was lucid. I was very lucid, but I was having conversations with people, but I wasn't, I, it wasn't their avatars I was concerned with anymore. It was like, man, each individual person I talked to was a wealth of, of information that I just found astonishing. And I listened to people talk about mundane things as they were waiting for the ambulance to get there. And it just, I had an awesome time, <laughs> even though I was bleeding out, I was bleeding out and I woke up in the, in the emergency room. So, uh, but what I'm saying is, 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 I love to have these discussions and try to bounce ideas and figure it out. But in truth, I, uh, my, I'm so divorced from the idea that there's anything to worry about, even in the apocalypse, even in uh, 2040, 2046. I, I mean, I will die for my beliefs 100%. I have no problem with that concept at all. Not because I don't fear death, but because I believe I have done such top-notch research and crossed all my, all my T's and dotted all my I's that I can show all this. Because on my channel, I'm not telling people what, what I believe. I'm showing it to them. They can go mm -hmm. find, they can go read it themselves. They can go put it all, they can get a calculator out and they can do it themselves. So, but in the long run, it just, nothing really matters as far as uh, the fear mongering anymore. It's like, mm. I don't care about the elite. I don't care about what the news is talking about. I don't give it. I mean, no, some of you guys, I mean, you might know my personal story too. I went to prison for some heinous stuff. I was a kidnapper. You know what I mean? I was involved in a terrible assault. Nobody really got hurt, but it was still an assault. So I'm a, I have. I have people men are hating on me and they open up their own channels and talk bad about me, but I don't care. There is nothing that's ever going to stop me from moving forward and doing what I believe I'm supposed to be doing right now. I have a lot of data to keep putting out and I don't give a damn how many detractors I have because I have a lot of supporters as well. But mm -hmm. in the end, I don't believe it's any individual discoveries that we make that are define us. They're, they're not. Uh, I believe it has everything to do with Campbell and you and I, I believe we're immortal souls. And I believe that for the longest time that the, the plan worked and the plan was to make us believe that we really had something to yeah. fear so we could develop a really good personality, <laughs> but it's yeah. over. It's over. The cat's out the bag. Timelines are unraveling. The oversoul is no longer concerned with hiding the truth anymore. Now it's almost as if the oversoul is promoting it. People are waking up so damn fast. It's causing problems. So that's where I'm I at right now. I love that. Grand organized design. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the only truth really is, or the only truth is love. Like that's like where it's always led me back to and I call that grand organized design and everything out of that is the use of our imagination you know and that's just us like tweaking and working and as you said defining our personalities and developing our own um creative expression on the matter and it all it does is chisel us as souls into yeah. more beautiful artworks and that's why I love it so much 
I guess I loved what you just said there. Beautiful description. Um, I was going to, Cam, would you have any questions? I've got uh, like no, no, 10,000 no, coming one, through. You, so yeah, please pop in go. before I start. Yeah, you anything? May, you may as well shoot because I've already been up with Campbell three times now. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right, so I want to tie. I want because of the the channel. I want to tie in the um this the skies of simulation, um, Tartaria, and where we are today with Tartaria coming through so strongly into the consciousness as people are waking up to this amazing, you know, truth of who they are and what we are, um, and our Australian Aboriginals. So those three can components, Jason, tie them together in your thoughts. Tie them together. Okay. Well. As far as Tartaria goes, there is no there is no doubt within my mind that in between the seventh and the fourteenth century A.D., we're talking about like eight eight hundred years ago, that there was a vast mariner race going around all over the world doing things, building these forts, and we find evidence of their architecture everywhere. Now, I believe they were in Australia. I believe they were. I believe they were. They were all over New Caledonia. I believe. Now, this is when the world still looked the way the way it does today, where the sea yeah. levels were pretty much, pretty much on par yeah. today. We have this now. Gavin Menzies did a really good job in that book, fourteen twenty one, the year that China discovered the world. He did a very good job showing how we really don't have an accurate assessment today of how well that they navigated the ancient world. Because he shows document after document from, from antiquity that the, they knew what they were doing. They knew where things were in the world. They were able to travel and do all that. Now, these, uh, these, um, these artifacts that have been found that are called Uparts, out-of-place artifacts, these are, they are basically from this time period from 700 AD all the way to 14. It's about a 650-year period. This is the greater tar this is basically the greater Tartary period. Now, Tartar, tar, you're just saying Tartaria, and I understand that's the more modern, that's the modern, basically, label yeah. that's put yeah. on the civilization. But Tartar, Tartary was basically, it comes from the word Tartarus, and it's indicative that at one time in the ancient world, there was a technologically advanced civilization that was in the far west. That's what Tartarus means. Yeah. It means the far, yeah, yeah, far yeah. west. Only yeah. later in history, yeah. only later in history, no, did it down. become attached to the idea of hell. Mm. It was never attached to the idea of hell, of hell initially, because initially Uranus Uranus, after they survived the cataclysm, Uranus, you know him, Uranus, he yeah. gets his sons all together and they cast lots for different areas of the geographical world because their families were already uh, uh, getting big again and they couldn't stay in the same land. So Uranus, Uranus and his sons cast lots and one of them cast the lot uh, of Tartarus. But he wasn't sent to hell. That only came hundreds of years later when these stories were reinterpreted from different frames of reference. Mm -hmm. He was banished to the far west. And this is what we find in the, initially in the Near East after the great cataclysm known as the day the sky fell. When, when the vapor canopy collapsed, they, they, they cast lots. The same story is found in the book of Jasher and the Jewish Haggadoths and, and, and other rabbinical writings as Noah and his sons yeah. casting lots for different areas of the world well one got the north one got the south one got to stay right there one got the east one got the west the, uh, the ones that stayed there were noah and his progeny but his four he had actually actually he had four sons one of them was was arba arba was the father of anak uh, a lot of people don't, don't realize this the bible cuts off with the lineage of Noah and only focuses on the lineage of Noah. But when you read these old other texts, you find out that after the cataclysm, Noah and Nama had more sons and daughters. They continued. Oh. And this caused a problem. This caused a problem in the ancient Near East. The problem was was Noah and Nama were pure blood pre-vapor, they were vapor canopy biology. So after the collapse of the vapor canopy, when they continued to have children, they had children that were of gigantic Giant. size, mm. and it became 
it became a threat to the people who were born after the collapse of the vapor canopy. Because once the, the, the vapor canopy was down, the genome had been changed. Now people are being born to sizes that are closer to us today. So, but when Noah, who had this awesome, awesome pre-flood uh, uh, genetics, he kept having sons and daughters, it caused a problem. One of his daughters was Semiramis. I don't know if you guys know about the history of Semiramis, but she was the queen of Babylon, yeah. uh, anciently wicked, wicked queen. But uh, she took it as one of her lovers, a half Titan, half giant, somebody who who was absolutely born first generation Titan after the collapse of the vapor canopy, but was also fathered by a giant who was already living after the vapor canopy. He had, so he was much bigger. He enters the historical record, you know, in the Hebrew text as Nimrod, but in, in, in the ancient world, he was called Amar Udaak. Later, later he was called Merodak, and then, he, then it became Marduk, and then it became Nimrod. Mm -hmm. Nimrod. It's all the same. It's all the same person. Wow. But he uh, in in Sumerian writings, he was called Gilgamesh, mm. which was mistranslated wow. about 100 years ago to, Gil, to Gilgamesh. It's called the Epic of Gilgamesh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But the, the true the true the true name is Gilgamesh. It's all the same person. Gilgamesh is just who he was in the first mm. part of his life before he became the king, the king of Akkad. But all Tartaria was was what Tartaria was a civilization that was west of the Near East, and it became very advanced. Mm -hmm. It was very it was, uh, uh, it was feared, and they left it alone. And it actually en enjoyed a, a a period of isolation where it could develop no wars, no nothing, because the rest of the world feared it, and they had stayed away. It was only about a thousand years after the collapse of the vapor canopy that kingdoms and empires began spreading, human population, that now they started spreading into Central Asia and Europe, and they come across this civilization that looked like it had been there for a very long time. It was, it was basically the Tartars, uh, the, Mag the Tartars, the Magyars, the, the ancestors of the, uh, of the Huns, uh, Central Europe's the ancestors of the Slavs is uh, basically the Central European stock. Does that go back? Yes, the Frisians de yeah, definitely. Yeah. Yeah, well, well, the Frisian the Frisians tell the tale. The yeah, yeah, uh, the yeah. Orlind manuscript is mm -hmm. fantastic. I have a copy. I have a copy of Orlind back here. But yeah, the Orlind they even date the collapse of the vapor canopy very very close to the to, to the actual date. Yeah, uh, yeah, the yeah. great cataclysm that caused that. The Orlind manuscript even describes calendars before the flood. It, it tells the truth. It says, in the days before the flood, men did not count the years; they counted days. That's in the oral end. Yeah, yeah. yeah it's, uh, there's a lot of there's a lot of yeah. old texts that that tell the truth about about all that. So, uh, um, as far as um, that civilization spreading to Australia, because obviously we've looked at like Sydney and Melbourne and Brisbane and our capital cities, and you know, they, it follows all the same architectural. Um, you know, it's structures and, and processes and um, it's basically all the same. But our Indigenous Australians, the ones that we've spoken to, have absolutely no record or knowledge of these cities existing at the same time as they did. So it's it's we, it's been a phenomenon talking to them. Well, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have to introduce a concept now Good. that we've, avoid, we've avoided in this video so far. Excellent. All right. Okay. We like to talk about our reality in a linear fashion. It's true. Yes. But I have I have explained on my own channel and I have given many examples that history may be a series of simulations Agreed. that were all fun and different ones were stopped. When whatever whatever protocol was made that was made for whatever 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 experiment was being run by the overseers, they stopped different historical timelines when they wipe the slate in the in the simulacrum they don't always remove the evidence because i mean this is this is this you have to understand it's it's a any sophisticated system is always going is always going to leave some type of trace elements for its activities and computers are yeah. the same way i can take i can take a thumb drive and i can have a lot on this thumb drive and then i can i can delete everything on this thumb drive on my computer but a cia analyst gets a hold of this thumb drive he's got access to to sophisticated equipment that can find basically a uh, ghost yeah. data that's in here basically find out what was on the on this he may not be able to get it all off but he can get it well the simulation would be the same thing 
a vast, a vast civilization in Australia. It's thriving for 350 years. They're building cities, infrastructure. And then all of a sudden the overseers decide, well, we don't need that. We need to, we need to make sure this place stays empty where this is going to get out of control here in a while. There's going to be 5 million people here. We need to put a stop to this. Uh, it's just like one of those old, old toys we had where we could draw pictures on there and we slide it. Everything, <laughs> yeah, everything yeah. vanishes. We can draw, we can draw a new picture. Yeah. But there, yeah. there's going to be, there's going to be some, uh, parts there's going to be fossils in the simulacrum itself because if we're in a simulation that's the result of layers of simulation then there's going to be there's going to be cross-pollination between these different realities reality tunnels converge all the time and they borrow in the they exchange information it can't always all be deleted without affecting other other area areas so if you look at it from a computer analyst perspective you're looking at the ability to stop an entire series of protocols, erase most of it, but you can't erase it all or you'll damage other things that are ongoing. Yeah. So you take out what you can. So 500 years later, we, we a whole new culture moves into the area and they see it. A plow overturns a, 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 a dressed cut block. And outside the city of Melbourne, all of a sudden, a whole pavement is undone and they know no one's been here. In, in recorded history. And then we find these old tra trace civilizations, pieces. We got to find all this in Australia, but you also find them in other places of the world that are inexplicable for which there are no histories. Australia is not an anomaly. These are found worldwide. Mm. These evidence that a whole series of histories was played out in this area for which we don't have a trace of information mm. from, other than the fact we can dig up like Gableki Tipi. Okay, we can dig up Gableki Tipi and not find a single human skeleton and then find out that it was buried completely in mud. And in order to to in order to justify it to the public that this is a legitimate archaeological <laughs> site, they they the, the scientists actually published that the people buried their city to preserve it before they left. Yeah. And the very act of getting enough dirt to bury Gobleki Tipi would have required more man hours to build than to build Gobleki Tipi itself. Yeah. And this is this is not it's not the only site that they say this on. There are many ancient civilizations that have been found completely entombed in dirt, but we don't find skeletons. We don't find we don't find the people. So uh, what I'm saying is, is if we're going to entertain simulation theory, then we need to be able to wrap our minds around the fact that somebody, if this is a simulation, then it's governed by protocols that someone else controls. And if there's somebody else controlling these, they're running experiments. And mm -hmm. if they're running experiments, that means they have the ability to stop and start di different programs. And if they have the ability to stop and start different programs, that means they can do that without leaving enough trace elements for us to discover unless we're deliberately searching well for that's so, so so jace like um i i've i think i love that we've campbell and i've definitely been like working with that as a model that there's been a simulated or a simultaneous timeline coexisting um you know per perceiving by different people in different ways but like when we talk about something like melbourne or sydney but let's just focus on melbourne because that's been a big focus of ours like it appears to us that basically the vast majority of Melbourne city was already there. Like it's not like it's not relics that were uncovered under the mud. Like it was like the, the vast majority of the city as it currently stands was already coexisting. And we we found it that way, like basically almost completely undug, you know, like in in almost the exact same way it is today. Like, so that's sort of like the energetic that we've been looking at. So like that would, that would um, denote potentially that our Indigenous were coexisting in a, a different simulation to, and so they weren't even seeing it, but that it is actually was completely almost in its entirety present as it is today. Like, I mean, that's taking it very far, you know, that's a, like, if, these aren't remnants, these were whole well, we, we look at timelines as that is that is, that is that is definitely we, that's definitely an anomaly. Mm, like when we think of timelines, we think that 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 they all keep continuing, but Jason's saying maybe they get cut, like the Toltecs, right? They all disappeared where they go. So I totally think they so get. This edited. is the thing. So Fuck yeah. maybe yeah, they hit a the point and they get cut, and that's why we've got all these 
who parts and unexplained phenomena and things because literally they've, they've cut that simulation and then put another people into the same, um, you know. Um, well, I mean, parts. we do have, we actually do have archaeological, ge I mean, geologic evidence of simulations being stopped. Now, we have interpreted it totally differently, but I can give you a bunch of examples uh, right now. So yeah. uh, we cannot scientifically explain although we gloss over it very well in our books but we cannot scientifically explain how you fossilize a jellyfish uh -huh. why are there earthworms found completely petrified yeah what yeah. happened to make the hairs on different ancient creatures stand out before they were turned to stone mm -hmm. we we have so many we're talking about mollusks that are found 700 feet below sea level solid stone yeah. even the tissue so what happened that flash froze the entire ancient world we have actual fossils of fish that were turned to rock in the very instant they were in the middle of giving birth to other fish yeah, wow. so we also also we have sharks that are in the middle of biting these are found fossilized no, it's nothing theoretical. Anybody can go to my channel and look at my two videos on on anomalous fossil finds and all that. I have over a hundred pictures of fossils that have been found displayed all over the world of things that are absolutely inexplicable. There's no way to turn these things into yeah, stone. Carbon. I have I've got pictures of octopus suction cups and stuff turn to absolute petrified stone you can't turn a jellyfish to stone it's impossible oh, the petrification process is defined in the uniformitarian theory of natural selection as when a creature is killed and buried and then and then yeah. compressed there's heat it's also water so they try to describe this flood and all that and they try to get you to think that okay maybe the great flood did all this and all that but it still does not account for the beautiful the beautiful little tin tentacles in cilia all the fine micro details of a jellyfish a jellyfish doesn't have any bones how did you turn it to stone mm. so this is what this is another one of my theories that when a when a systemic shutdown occurs it's a flash freeze everything is flash frozen that's why we have mammoths that have tulips yeah. undigested like the on pause button just like yeah. the pause button sure. boom yes Every like the pause paused. button yeah yeah yep. Just makes look, sense just like that just like yeah. that and it's happened i mean it's happened we see the evidence of it everywhere we, mm. it has happened so so i'm often saying this on my channel if we can show that any one thing has happened then it's happened all the time or everywhere it's there are no there are no there are no uh anomalies if, if we can show that one thing is true somewhere then it's true everywhere it's yeah, just that's just the way you have to define reality that way I know, because love that if, you're, if you don't if you don't you're just cherry picking and you know like you know i'm i i'm a graphic designer so i mean i work in photoshop and indesign and illustrator all the time and you know like it's really easy for me to like pause something here have it frozen in time implement it like put it in to this picture here add moving images here and bring together five different techniques and mediums and create a brand new image a completely new story. Like I can fully see from that analogy how you could mm. freeze the cities of to, uh, the the cities that we know as Melbourne and Sydney, um, have them frozen in time, have a, another um, experience playing out in in video time, being our indigenous and the the culture going on there, and having this frozen, and then having another um, medium coming in, maybe the two hundred and fifty years ago, the explorers. And them all interacting right. in basically one image stream okay. coming in from, yeah, yeah, I can so see that. And from a simulation as a graphic designer, that totally fucking works, man. That's totally yeah. easy and functioning. Yeah. <laughs> That's good. They're like, we don't, yeah, we don't need to like, I mean, a lot of um, our discussions are obviously just using our imagination, Jace. We're just getting into it from that perspective. But like, we can totally work with the idea that, when we when we say Tatari consciousness, we we're not talking so much about the Tates. We're talking now about this 
this burgeoning new understanding that's been sort of like term Tartaria. Right. Um, but, you know, people are waking up to the fact that, you know, history is absolutely not what they've been told. Right. So, you know, like I can see Campbell, like Melbourne, Sydney, because Australia obviously is this amazing container because we've got this, we've got this mm. tiny time frame. You know, our history donates it as like this tiny 250 window where we should have only had these sort of, you know, Archi um, architectural feats happening in the last 200 years, whatever. So it gives us a good, good, I don't know, page to work on. It's like a page mm. in Photoshop. But, you know, we've got this, like, really fully developed cities. And, like, we, we can, we have evidence that so much now. They are fully developed, beautiful, standing, solid cities, and we've just walked right into them. And then at the same time, we have interviewed several elders now who hold very, very, um, you know, ancient knowledge of their um, timelines and they do not cross at all. They don't like to, nothing. Right? There's nothing so going on how about this? at the same time. So how about this? Uh, I, have mentioned, I have mentioned a few times on my own channel, but if, if these cities are, as you say, and they were found that way, then, then we're... <coughs> We're dealing with a phenomenon that has also been documented in the 1800s in the United States. Yes. So, if if we have actual cities that for which we don't have any records that they were built, but we know they just appeared in the historical record, and then later they're occupied by us. Now, this denotes to me that what happened was very similar to what happened in 1902. Because I've documented so much in 1902 how on the world scene out of nowhere exploded all the companies that are now Fortune 500 companies today. They had their birth in yeah. 1902. Now, and, and this is what I, do, I documented. Now, for these th for these companies not to exist in 1900, and most of them not, not in 1901, but to explode on the scene in 1902 and a few more in 1903, and for what you're saying about these cities, then – this would be direct evidence of, of, of a reset for which we have nothing, nothing in the historical record. No books mention them, no, no. And that's what happened in 1902. 1902 didn't have anything in, at the time except for volcanoes that were killing a lot of people. Like at Martinique, a volcano incinerated uh, 30,000 people. And one guy survived named August. Uh, he survived because he was in a pit. He was supposed to die as a convicted criminal. And he never died. He he lived. And then he traveled with the Barnum and Bailey Circus, man. And he was uh, he was on display because he's the only person that survived Mount Paley's explosion on Martinique in 1902. And it was a big deal. But uh, 1902 was very interesting, but it was a reset because uh, we don't really know what happened from 1890 to 1901. We just have evidence of it. And I did a whole video recently about that, that when these resets happen, we find this architecture and we find these things in geopolitics that don't make any sense because they had no development. They just appeared on the world scene. Mm -hmm. So we have the evidence of a reset, but it's like, here's all these children that just appeared. We don't know where their parents mm -hmm. are, but at the time it seemed normal to put these kids in factories mm -hmm. and, to, and to raise them in these different orphanages. It seemed normal at the time, but 30 years later, people are writing books like what the hell happened 30 years ago for all this. It's always in retrospect yeah. that we, that we see the evidence of resets we never see it as they're playing well out. i mean the world trade fairs they were fantastic like they sort of like all appeared around 1890 and there they're wheeling out all of the products yeah. the things the times the events the, it's like this the edge of the school of what you're about to here's what yeah. you're going to use in this culture here's all the things i can see how the companies would have been introduced at that point from those world trade fair offerings and yeah. also, that was also the birth of science fucking fiction, man. Mm. Like, yeah. Science fiction is phenomenal back then. It's like, it's so right at the reset, there was the birth of science fiction and obviously the introduction of the World Trade Affairs. So mm. all of that is just such a lovely like so, presentation I, so, of fact and fiction. Let me tell you how my mind works. So I take this into consideration iteration of this of this picture you just painted me all right i assimilate that data with what i know about 1902 and how everything i've documented about that so in my mind i'm now i'm going i'm i'm i'm, I'm investigator now there's no phenomena that will unfold in our world that is not 
is not in some way causal. There's a reason why it can't just happen. There's got to be a reason. So, what the, the the picture that was just forming in my mind with when we were talking about this is that okay, Europeans were moving too fast and they built some cities in Australia and maybe and maybe New Zealand. Europeans were moving faster than the timeline could account for. The overseers were not happy about the development. Now, on my own channel, one of my main quotes that I'm always saying is that it only takes us 200 years to go from horse and buggy to Hadron Collider. I say that a lot because I need to paint a picture in people's minds how incredibly dynamic humans are. From horse and buggy to Hadron Collider only takes two centuries. Therefore, the picture that's painted in my mind is were we reset in the 1800s because in the 16 and 1700s we grew too fast? That would fast? make sense to me. Yeah, I mean that like that would make sense to what mm. we're talking about today. 100. Well, I mean, when you look at the tech, everything, the clothes, the music, the steampunk, art, steampunk, you know, everything in the like uh, yes, steampunk is a very good mm. steampunk is a very good example. Yeah, right. Yeah, and then Came by the in, 1800s, yep. it's all black and white, isn't it? Black suits, everything's not you know all the art's gone from everything. Yeah. It's very you know like reset looking. Yeah, empty, yeah. like it's ready to be filled in and enter the world trade fairs, enter science. It's fiction. Here's your difference between fact and fiction. Mm. Here's how your perception of reality, where everything fits. Here's all the things you're going to use. Here are the cultures you're interacting with. All right, go forward, starting again. It yeah, does yeah. feel like that. It does. Very so, cool. so essentially, what you're suggesting, Jace, is that there's like a the you, you call them the overlords or the overseers, like that. There is actually a um, a time. What would be the word? Like they they've got a notion of the natural um, way Michaels. they want us to move forward, a natural evolutionary timeline right. that, in some way, for some reason, is serving either us or them. Or it is, you know, I mean, I call, I mean, those over overlords. You're not putting that down to grand organized design. No, you're actually saying this is a, this is something. This is an, an entity onto itself. Something past what we would know is well. Uh, my own, my yeah. You know, my own belief system is that there is an oversoul, but he has not. He, he or she doesn't have much to do with what's going on here. Now, I believe we live in a contained world, and that necessarily implies there must be a much bigger outside world for this just to be a containment. So yeah. that being the case, on the outside. Of of this field then we have overseers just like the oldest oldest writings say that god you know god made mankind in his image well that tells me that humans made humans to live in the smell that there's no no mystery here the real mystery is the oversoul that is cool with all this the oversoul that is allowing for these simulations to be conducted and run for whatever reason be they be they be they run simulations that are run because we're trying to scientifically find out uh, a series of un understand problems on the outside of the construct, or if the problems are fictions that were introduced into the narrative of the simulacrum to make us further believe that we are in danger when we're not. Because the belief that we are in danger is what would develop the personality. If immortals truly found out they were in a simulation in the collective, then, then all of it would all be for naught because the output would be affected. And as long as it's only a minority who know the truth, and the majority are still playing ball, then the simulacrum will work just fine in producing whatever scientific output needs to be produced for those on the outside. But evidently, we're, we're in a construct that has a timed release, and we were moving too fast. This is the threat that's found in the Tower of Babel story, yeah. because the Tower of Babel story is, is not what we've been told. Mm -hmm. It's actually a failed threat against humanity, because it says specifically that overseers, calls them gods, they talked among themselves, not to humans, and they said, look, the man has become mm -hmm. as one of us. Uh, there is nothing impossible for them. Their imaginations are taken off. We need to do something. So what do they do? They created division and strife, and they destroyed the architectural project that we were working on because we had realized that we were in a containment field and we yes, wanted to I've, get out. That's what yeah. we did. Yeah, I agree with that story. Yes. Okay. Well, that opens up a whole other level of conversation. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Because if if what you're if what we're suggesting is possible, then we're on the verge, therefore, of another reset. 
Yes. Because yeah, I enough. 2040. I mean, many people are becoming conscious of this, which is it would be um, not in alignment with the time release in, in us moving forward here. I mean, where do we go from? Like, are you theorizing that we are on the verge of another time reset? Oh. And are you think? Well, I'm 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 pretty vocal about my beliefs. We are a we're heading toward a utopia. It's an artificial one, but it's still going to be good times for a lot of people nonetheless. The utopia is what we're moving into, but it's going to be abruptly stopped by the very reset you're talking about. And so I have over 41, 42 videos that talk about this 2040 reset, the month of May, and all the all the historical times that this exact same reset happened. And uh, yeah, it's for we're heading toward a new utopia and it's going it's going to actually occupy the minds of a lot of people it's going to it's designed for a distraction i've been telling people for 2 years on my channel i've been doing predictions videos you know, using date sequence prediction and isometric projections i've been showing people that that all this narrative all this doom saying all this negativity that's been going on since uh, 2019 2020 and 2021 2022 is over in 2023 you're going to see all new a whole series of events are about to unfold it's going to change a lot of things there a lot of nations are going to start internalizing this whole 2030 uh, uh, agenda deal is going to be exposed for what it is, which was fear mongering. It's not true. We're going to be heading into a utopia, but it's not going to last but about 15 years. And then 2040 happens and uh, it's a whole nother series of events. <laughs> but resets, resets aren't, aren't something that, that just happened. They're scheduled. Yeah. This is what the point yeah. of this is what the point of my channel is. I show the scheduling. I show exactly not only when it happened in, in, in throughout history, but I show and I reveal those who knew it was going to happen and predicted it with accuracy. So if it's scheduled and it's inevitably going to happen, um as everyone affected, no matter what, or is is there um a different impact versus on the consciousness of the individual? Yes. Okay. I, I'm going I'm to be the first one to be honest with you about that. I have not worked out all those details. Mm. I don't. I just know the exact chronology. Now, I see a lot of evidence that the elite fear it because they're always mm. hiding. Uh, uh, they're always hiding. And this is the subject matter of many of my videos. The, uh, the elite has the, the, the elite, they must serve another master. Because this is what the purpose of the Phoenix was in the most ancient records. We have Gnostic, the, the trimorphic pro and on the origin of the world. These are ancient Gnostic documents from the Nag Hammadi Library in Egypt, and they're very specific about the purpose of the Phoenix. The Phoenix was to keep the Archons in check. Well, the elite follow the Archons. The Archons are what give them their power to control over the minds and masses, the masses of the people. I said, but the Phoenix was always designed to keep them in check. Archons are lords yeah. of time. They manipulate our perception of time. They manipulate uh, uh, histories and all that. But the phoenix appears no matter what the calendar is, no matter who changes the calendar. It doesn't matter if it's Julian, if it's Islamic Hejra, if it's Gregorian old style, or if it's Gregorian new style. It does not matter. Phoenix appears every 138 years. And last in 1902, we know for a fact the elite predicted they knew about it because they hid. But as soon as they realized that the this wasn't the big one, 1902 they were relatively safe and they had another 138 years as soon as they realized that you can see from the historical record what happened they unleashed their wealth hundreds of companies were born in a year mm, yeah so <clears throat> because like you know we get like the idea that we get this far and we worked it out and we understand relatively speaking you know pretty well and you know it's going to keep going if we're like heading towards 2040 it, you know, 10, 20 more years worth of understanding. Like it seems a bit like, um, you know, a bit of a drag to think that we would get to that level of consciousness and then just reset back into it. Okay, okay. You See, know? Yeah, I, I get you. I do 100%. I understand where you're coming from. But you're very unfamiliar with a lot of my findings as well. I, because, I, I Sorry, I am. It's true, okay, Because, listen, an awareness, an awareness of any phenomena gives you power over that phenomena. All right. Yes. The awareness of power produces a power. Yes. Just like 
Y'all, we live in a reflective medium. It's just like if you believe opposition exists, then opposition will appear. So the same thing happens for the Phoenix phenomenon. Those who are aware of it and don't fear it are not on that frequency. Phoenix comes and goes. There are communities that survive all the time. I just did a video about a major cataclysm that happened in the in the old world that's very well known. It is the destruction of, of the Mohenjo-Daro civilization, the Harappan civilization, which happened at the exact same time as the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah, which happened the same time as Admin and Zeboam and the Sumerian cities were all laid waste. It's in the lamentation texts of the old, of, of the Near East. It's very, but what's very interesting, the path of destruction is, is, is well known. However, there was one community called Zela, that totally survived. This is what this is what resets are like. A community of like-minded individuals can basically create their own reality. It's their own reality bubble, and they're insulated from whatever's going on in the collective. On a personal level, that's also the message of my Archaics channel. I'm always explaining, even when I'm doomsaying, I'm always explaining to people that that there are two different realities that are coexisting right now. Yeah. One of them is for the collective and you're more than welcome to join it. As a matter of fact, artificial intelligence X is always trying to induce you to join it and to modify your behavior to, to conform to the collective because it's less power, power expenditure on its behalf. But there's another reality going on at all times. It's because you are a singularity, meaning you're an immortal soul trapped in a husk. That means you create your own reality tunnel and you are perfectly insulated from the entire collective if you choose to be but as soon as you focus on anything in your environment and you fear it you borrow its fate whatever it's going to go through you're going to go through too this is the story of lot's wife when she turned around for a split second to see what was happening to her friend her friends in the city of sodom when it was being destroyed from the sky she turned around and vaporized with them that's a, it, i don't know if the story is true or not but the but the message is yeah, real yeah the analogy yeah for mm. sure wow nice all right all right, we've been going for two and a half speak, hours, Cam guys. No, so. no, 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 wait, wait, Campbell, Campbell, you can't stop it. Yeah, I just have one. I just got to go for one more second. <laughs> so, like, okay, that's it, which is, and I agree with you what you just said, Jason, I, totally. Um, and it's a really interesting um, concept because, like, what that would mean is that there's going to be a, a body of consciousness consciously living alongside a reset and conscious of it oh, hold on stop. Like I, I need to stop you right there yes go i'm going to quote a prophecy right now that says exactly what you okay. just said okay cool. all right <laughs> two women will be grinding at the meal mill one will be taken and the other left two men will be working in the field one will be taken and the other left yes listen the Phoenix phenomenon and any other phenomenon that we experience is always discretionary. This is why we are basically masters of our own fate. This yeah. is why ABC, NBC, CBS, BBC, all the major news networks are steadily feeding you fear porn because if they can get you to vibrate on the wrong frequency you're a part of the collective because for some reason the elite do not like individuality now on the same token i am becoming more and more convinced over these past few weeks that the elite may not like individuality but we must have a benefactor that opposes them because there are many of us putting material out and we have not been yeah. silenced yeah that's a good point yeah yeah um just just i was I just going to say so like, and then you know sorry yes do, go do you think a phoenix event a reset event is that when they're is that when they're cutting and pasting timelines is that sort of like you know these two different you know obviously this is going to be an opinion um you know does the collective kind of get wiped out and those who are thinking for themselves get to sort of go forward on the new timeline okay. is, that, is that kind of thing yes yes yeah, there's there's okay um that's a whole it's very difficult to answer this and 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 know that you're you're, you're understanding exactly what i'm saying okay. listen every 138 years it's not just red dust red man yeah, yeah. And it's not just volcanoes it's not earthquakes tsunamis it's not just some weird diseases that that suddenly appear it's mass abductions i say a 
abductions, but it's actually mass vanishings. Whole van just like the children's crusade. Yeah. So many, so many children just vanished in 1212, which is a Phoenix, Phoenix year. But the 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 people of the time were so mystified about the vanishing of so many children. We're talking about hundreds of thousands of children in Europe just up and disappeared. Now, this is in 12, 12 AD. Now, it was during the Crusades, so the authorities at the time said, okay, look, we'll just tell the people it was the Children's Crusade. All the kids came together because evidently only the children of God could, could defeat the Muslims, but it wasn't true. It was propaganda. It was a story that was invented to, to explain something that the church couldn't explain, the total absolute vanishing of hundreds of thousands of kids. So 1902. We have so many weird edits. We have so many things that just unusual that happen. It's not just natural phenomena. It's exactly what you're saying. These 138 year periods, this is when systems are put back in the, into their corresponding reality tunnels. Anything that's out of whack or anything that's not going the way that the elite want them to go, this is when everything's put back. Look, for over 200 years, a certain culture of people were making war against Europeans. They, they were making war through finances, through banks that were fu funding both sides of, of the war between the states. They were doing all these things. Now, they just couldn't get a real good stronghold in the West. They were always opposed, and it was really ticking them off. In well, in 1902, all of a sudden, they got put on their course. They got empowered. 17 years later, they exterminated 23 million white Christian Christian Russians, and they created the Soviet Empire and turned an entire uh, uh, nation descended from Tartary into atheists, and then turned around and used that nation for the Cold War to instill fear in all the other nations of the world for the whole nuclear scare and the space race and all that, all the way up until 1991 when those people finally broke free from the Bolsheviks. Wow. It's a uh, it's some deep history, but we're gonna yeah. This video's gone way too long for us to go into that direction. Uh, yeah. Kelly would have a few. Sorry, my you, fault, my fault. But, um, <laughs> I mean, we, yeah, we can always do this again in the future. But Kelly, you want to talk? No, no, I talk agree. We should we should call it a day. But I've loved it. I you know the really the looking at the how the timeline edits, how the cultures mm. come up against each other, and then. Um, how when one's conscious of it coming and conscious of the expression of it and then it actually happening again, being conscious of it, like that's a whole other another discussion, which I just find absolutely fascinating. I find it very easy to conceptualize this as a graphic designer and working with all the medium inputs that you can potentially put into actually building a physical timeline mm. in, um, uh, you know, like in design or whatever. Mm. And it, yeah, it's really quite easy to imagine it from that perspective. And when you look at it as a simulation and then, you know, use what we use as a simulation, the computer, and then use the, the programs on the computer, it's all very easy to understand. Yeah. So um, what I'm very fascinated in now is moving forward, you know, as we hold this information and continue to really process it and understand it, what that looks like as we move through our actual reset. Like that is a phenomenal sort of body of questioning and, and looking, that's a good quest in that concept. So I would really love to have another show as, starting from there, <laughs> from that Well, edit. I mean, throughout, throughout the course of history and all the th things we suffered in the past through different life sims, I believe we've been victims all this time. But yes. The awakening that's occurring now in the next 15, 15 16 years, I think this next one is going to be fundamentally Agreed. different because even it's also attached to a concept for which it's never been attached to in the past. And that is apocalypse. Now the media is going to get you to think the apocalypse is a very negative thing, but it actually means to unveil. The unveil truth. Yes. So, so yeah, we, it's, it's a, uh, yeah, before I don't want to talk anymore before we just go off. And talk yeah, about I know another question. <laughs> go yeah, up we'll, for yeah, yeah. Go yeah. On. I know. Well, I mean, fucking hell, man, that was awesome to meet you, Jace. Fantastic. That was yeah, we'll, really, really, really fun. Yeah, we'll do this again. No yeah, doubt. Yes. Yeah, Definitely. Thanks, thanks for your time. <laughs> of course, you two have got an event coming up. So, well, not together, but one one there and one streamed in. So enjoy that event. And um, yeah, thanks for everyone watching. And we will definitely be in touch, Jace, because we would definitely like to awesome. continue this conversation down the line. So thank you uh, for your time. Awesome. Total thank honor, you, my yeah. friend. Thank you so much for your brilliant brain and mind and <laughs> your position here on the planet. And being here to discuss this with us is just fantastic. You're 
breath of fucking fresh air. Yeah. So thank you so well, much for I appreciate it. linking appreciate your consciousness you, with mate. us. It was really, really fun. Thank yeah. You. And thanks for your time. Hey, I will uh I'll put this on my channel too. Oh, uh, after I record it off of yours. I'll yep. just need your links. Whatever links you guys want me to put, because uh yep. Like I said, I got a, I got a pretty active channel, and I, yeah. I don't I don't I think there's a lot of people that are on my channel that are not as subscribed to you. So we cool, definitely. Yep, yep. We need to send um, them over there. It'll be going up um, next Thursday, so I can send you over the copy as well if you want, um, and any links. And yeah, okay, awesome, awesome, okay. fantastic, Jace. Well, look, you have the awesome. best best rest Thank of your you night much. or day wherever you are in the right. timeline. <laughs> <laughs> and we'll be in touch. All right, cheers, mate. All right, guys, have a lovely day. You See too. you later. Thanks all. <laughs> See ya. Bye. Later.